Oh, there's almost a hush over the room. That's good. Hi, everyone. My name's Steve Peters. I work with the Energy Division at ADB, and uh, we put a session together for you on hydrogen today, which will cover two slots. The first slot, we'll talk a little bit more about technology and may have an introduction to a bit more about what hydrogen is about. And many of you will know this, but I think it's important that we all get a, a level about what it is, what it can and what it can't do and whether it's appropriate. The second session will be run by uh, my friend Emanuele, who's over there uh, from IRENA, which will talk about planning and talking about developing projects and, you know, looking at and getting to the bottom of this. What we hope you get out of this is an understanding of what hydrogen is, which is an energy carrier. It's not the answer to all our prayers. It's not the answer to decarbonisation. It's just an energy carrier and what the projects are, which can work and what they can't work and then allows you enough vocabulary that you can go off and do your own work. So this session will be moderated by my good mate, Mark Fogarty, who is also an Australian. Mark is the director of, uh, which is the name? Energy, Clean Energy Asia, and is the regional director for the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, REAP.org. Uh, and he was the founding CEO of the Sustainable Energy Development Agency in New South Wales back in the 1990s when Australia cared about the environment. And now um, we sort of, he can show his face in Asia now because we are doing probably a bit more than we have for the last decade. That's for all my friends in the Pacific, especially at the back. Um, so Mark, I'll hand over to you. Floor's yours, sir. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, what we were going to do, I think we've got a very good lineup of speakers. Yeah, that uh, we're going to run through. Um, we've got a video to start with from Unido. Um, thank you. And then I think we've got four or five speakers, I think, just to take us through some sl short slide presentations. They'll come back to the floor and then ultimately we'll throw it into a panel um, from, from the stage. And hopefully, um, given I think the interest that's here today, and I think many of the faces have travelled a long ways, throw open, do some uh, some questions um, and, and hope answers um, at the conclusion. So I might start with Hans and uh, I'd like to get him to open up if I could. Um, I think it's, it's, it's all ready to go. And uh, yes, by way, a quick background, uh, Hans Henning uh, Judic is CEO of JE Access Limited. Uh, he's going to talk to us, I think, with some different perspectives. But before we, we jump in, Hans, we might just run the video. Mm. Is that OK? Oh, yeah. Uh, are you ready to go with that? OK, thank you. This is uh, Unido. Thank you very much. A warm welcome from Vienna, from Unido. A warm welcome from Vienna, from UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Within the UN family, we have the mandate to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development for poverty alleviation. Within our work, we have initiated uh, one and a half years ago, our global program for green hydrogen in industry. You know that green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources and as such is an energy carrier that does not produce CO2 emissions when it is applied in industries. So green hydrogen is a means for country to achieve their uh, Paris Agreement commitments, but also help to establish a new uh, low carbon industries. Green hydrogen can help is of course crucial for decarbonization of the so-called hard to abate sectors, which at the moment are producing up to 15, average 15% 15 of the global CO2 emissions. Here we are talking about steel, cement, uh, ammonia production, uh, some parts also um, on the glass production. But in these sectors, you don't have alternatives. So green hydrogen is an alternative. But green hydrogen, and that's, and that's coming from the industrial development side, also offers huge opportunities for creating new industries, for creating low uh, carbon industries in developing and transition countries. So it's not just the, an, another commodity, but it can be a really game changer, especially for the global south to 
um, trigger new industry development, create jobs, and mobilize investments. So all in this, we have launched, as I mentioned before, our global program for green hydrogen in industry. And this program has uh, two pillars. And both pillars uh, have the aim to advance production, but also application of green hydrogen in developing transition countries. A warm welcome from Thank you very much. Um, we're going to invite Teddy from UNIDO as a country representative to come up and join us. Uh, but appreciate that introduction. So we might go back to flick the switch to you again to your hands and, uh, and get you to give us, I think, the perspective, interesting perspective uh, on, on hydrogen. You've lost a minute already. <laughs> yeah, I'm only. I have only one minute to talk. Yeah, <laughs> it should be reset. Anyway, I don't have my slides on there anyway yet. Ah, here we go. All right. So let's start. Hydro hydrogen will definitely play an important role in the defossilization drive. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a solution to get to net zero. Uh, hydrogen production with Haber-Bosch process is well known since the first decade of the 20th century. So we, oops, we have to ask ourselves why is the use of hydrogen still limited to a very few applications? The main uh, uses are fertilizer, urea, desulfurization of fossil fuels, and AdBlue. Uh, I don't want to go too deeply into the uh, mechanics here, but uh, we have to consider that 3% uh, of the global carbon emissions are currently from production of hydrogen. So that is as much as the whole maritime industry is expelling. It's quite substantial. So we have to get rid of that first. Uh, I feel sometimes if I hear politicians, I, uh, I feel reminded of this uh, cartoon. The teacher is asking, before I ask the question, can anybody anticipate the answer? And the answer is hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Everything can be done with hydrogen. Our, um, I'm from Germany, so our Minister of Economics is one of these guys. He is constantly, for every uh, solution, is hydrogen. And Germany will have to import 70% of the hydrogen. So hydrogen is promoted like the Swiss army knife. That means you can do everything with it. Yeah. So you have chemical and process technology for steel production. And, and, and you have aviation and shipping. You can do land transport with it. You can heat with it. And of course, power systems. Yeah. Everything you can do with this almighty hydrogen. What are the sources of hydrogen production today? That is natural gas, 59%, byproducts, which means other processes, chemical processes have a hydrogen output, coal, 19%, oil, 0.6%, and fossil fuels with uh, carbon capture is a mere 0.7%. So we have to make a reality check for what is green hydrogen really good. Only 1% of all hydrogen today is green hydrogen. 99% is uh, from fossil sources like coal, natural gas, and uh, some with carbon capture, some without. So fossil hydrogen has to be avoided because it has 1.2 times more CO2 footprint than the source material. So uh, if you have natural gas and burn it, uh, hydrogen will require 1.2 times more. So getting uh, to net zero requires green hydrogen, for sure. We have to replace 90 million tons, and they have to uh, be produced with green electricity. And we have to ask ourselves, is that feasible? Let's make a 90 million tons green. A very efficient electrolyzer consumes about 50 megawatt hours of electricity to produce one ton of hydrogen. 
So if we have 90 million tons, we need 4,500 terawatt hours of green electricity, 4,500 terawatt hours. Remember that this is actually all of the green electricity in the world from solar and wind together that is produced in 2023. Uh, and even in 2025, it will be half. So that means it's competing with EVs, households, maritime and aviation industry, and other industrial sec sectors like steel, uh, which are all uh, uh, trying to get a hand on a green hydrogen. So there is a competition. Back to our uh, minister. Germany will have to import 70% of the hydrogen. How do they want to do that? That's a good question. So let's see. How do we transport 70%? Of course, in form of ammonia, because hydrogen itself needs 250 degrees, minus 250 degrees centigrade, very cold, very energy intensive. So we do ammonia. We, let's say we have 100 megawatt hours that we want to transport. We convert it into green uh, ammonia uh, with Haber Bosch and electro electrolysis combined. They have an efficiency of 38%. That means uh, out of the 100 megawatt hours, only 38 megawatt hours go into the ammonia. But that's not all. Now we transport it. I haven't even calculated that. But uh, when we come to Germany, we would have to uh, convert it with green NH3 cracking, which has, again, only an efficiency of 77%. So we end up with 30 megawatt hours. And now we want to have electricity. So that means we need uh, uh, fuel cells, which have uh, about 50% efficiency or even worse gas turbines. And then we end up with 10 to 15% of what we have input. Is that really attractive? I don't know. So how about CCS and CCUS? The fossil industry is proposing that very much, but 50 years it's around and the technology is not working as advertised. Instead of 5 billion tons that were predicted uh, in the clean coal drive in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, today only 39 million tons are captured. Uh, 10 out of the 13 flagship CCS projects fail to deliver what they are supposed to deliver. So uh, captured carbon comes mainly from, uh, uh, it's mainly in, uh, used for enhanced oil recovery. That means it's used to push more uh, fossil fuel out of the, of the, uh, out of the soil. Okay, uh, it looks like this. Nearly three quarters of the CO2 that is actually captured annually is re-injected into oil fields to push out more oil and gas out of the ground. So 27% only is really stored. So, Let's have another look. We need a, a, a glass here to even see it. It's 0.7% uh, of the fossil fuels with CCUS only. Uh, accordingly, now a lot of NGOs are calling to policymakers to reject carbon capture and storage as a false solution because it's promoting uh, um, the fossil industry. So uh, we have to think hard about other options and uh, we are actually having one. It's, uh, it's a fuel that is carbon negative. So we are using mother nature. Oh, here's no, we're using uh, mother nature CCS. CO2, water and sunshine is converted into, um, into biomass. The biomass when it's used for some products, these products are carbon neutral. So we are producing carbon neutral diesel fuel from, uh, with our machine from uh, the uh, cellulosic material, but that's not all. We have the lignin and the lignin goes into biobitumen and biobitumen is used for road construction. So in biobitumen, the CO2 is completely sealed and never goes back into the atmosphere. That means both together means carbon negative fuel. So a ship that is using our, uh, our fuel will be actually a carbon capturing device. Very funny, but it's uh, just 
so uh, coming back to the energy consumption, uh, hydrogen requires, I have calculated it on uh, tons of oil equivalents to make it comparable. So uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen requires uh, 17,000 kilowatt hours to be produced. Ammonia requires 26,000 kilowatt hours. Renewable eth uh, methanol requires 27.5 uh, kilowatt hours, 27.5 uh, megawatt hours to be produced. Our fuel process requires 400 kilowatt hours. And if we calculate all the collection and uh, pre-processing of the material, we end up at around two megawatt hours. So 10%. I think that's a good solution. Anyway, a little bit uh, advertising for what we are doing. Nonetheless, Green hydrogen is very, very necessary for, uh, for producing fertilizer, for still uh, for desulfurizing uh, uh, the fossil uh, fuels. And uh, we need it still, yeah. So that's where we should start because that requires 4,500 4, terawatt hours. Keep that number in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. It's nothing like a, a good dose of reality, I think, to get, uh, to get the game underway. So thank you very much for that. It, it seems to me that um, uh, we'll be talking about this um, for subsequent ACS for some time to come. Um, I'd like to talk, introduce um, Matthew Gears, if I could, um, to come up and give his presentation. Um, Matthew is Director of Asia HDF Energy. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for the for the introduction. I guess the slides will uh, appear. Okay. So I can count until six. So but I will introduce myself while uh, waiting for the slides. So my name is Mathieu. As you mentioned, I'm director of Asia for HDF Energy. As you can hear, HDF is uh, is French. So I'm French, uh, but I'm based in Asia. I'm based in Jakarta. This is where we drive our, our development for the whole uh, region. And we are present in, uh, in seven countries of, uh, of Asia, Philippines in, included. So basically, as, a, as an introduction, I will talk about uh, how it's possible to make green hydrogen happen today, not in 10, 15, or 20 years, but really today. Uh, even though it's versatile, there are right applications for, for hydrogen. So we, we mentioned that earlier, hydrogen is versatile. Uh, this is the beauty of hydrogen, but it can be also... Um, alors, just the, um, the countdown hasn't started to be sure that uh, I won't speak for forever. Uh, so the versatility is, uh, is interesting. It's an opportunity. It explains uh, why there is this momentum around hydrogen, basically because we can decarbonize uh, most of the sectors. So that is very good. The challenge is where we start, uh, especially when we are developing countries. Should we start in a in petrochemical sector, electricity, heat? Uh, that can be a challenge. But on the long term, the potential is massive. And the trend is there. You can see here a slide uh, about the global dynamic, the number of projects. Uh, so it's huge. I won't read the figures aloud. Uh, it, it's quite big. That is important because uh, firstly, is driven, uh, I think, mainly by uh, Europe, Japan, Australia. They can afford subsidies. And that is a good news because it means that the projects will happen. It won't be blah, blah forever. It will help uh, to have a learning curve. It will help also to uh, scale up uh, the manufacturing capacity of key technologies and to bring down the prices. So if we want hydrogen to be competitive, this is a necessary step. And this is happening in Europe, Japan, and Australia. However, when we talk about Asia, uh, it's not only Singapore, Japan, uh, guys who can finance a lot of expensive stuff. It's also about Philippines, about Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on. So what do we do in those countries? We cannot uh, beg for uh, subsidies to make hydrogen happen. We need to find a way how to make uh, those projects uh, materializing on the short run. And on our side, we believe that the right applications is the, the power sector. Um, 
So hydrogen is a gas. Uh, on the long run, it will be a commodity which can be used as a, as a fuel. But, but you need an off-taker for that. You need, a, uh, you need an off-taker who can afford the price. You need to transport the hydrogen. That will take time. Uh, on the short run, we believe it might be more convenient to use it as a storage solution because you can produce everything on site. You don't need to develop a, a heavy and expensive infrastructure uh, because you don't sell the hydrogen. You sell kilowatt hour. The hydrogen is used as a storage component. And that way, if we have a bankable PPA, we do have a bankable green hydrogen project. And hence, we can bring a reference to the country, a learning curve, and start expanding towards our application. So I will explain how we do that, uh, in what type of context, and uh, our progress in the region. Um, so firstly, a few words about uh, the downsides of uh, renewable energies. Uh, even though solar and wind uh, are great, uh, the last decade we saw that uh, uh, it's easy to develop. It's affordable, it's bankable. That's why there are gigawatt of solar and wind installed worldwide. The downside is the, um, the intermittency. The intermittency can be difficult uh, uh, for certain grids uh, because the grid is too small, because uh, there is a lack of diversity into the mix. Uh, the, the intermittency can be uh, challenging at the edge of large system also. So in those contexts, we see that uh, solar and wind will have difficulties to accelerate its development, wh whatever the price is, not a question of price. It's a question of uh, compatibility with the grid. So in those contexts, we see that hydrogen can play a role to make the power more firm, as you can see on the right side uh, of the slide. So this is what we try to do as SGF, as a project developer and IPP, is to transform the intermittency into stable power by using uh, uh, hydrogen as a storage uh, solution. And we do it that way by combining uh, so the whole system, renewable energies, the batteries, but also the hydrogen. I was talking about um, the difficulties to transport hydrogen as a molecule today. Uh, you need a, a pipeline, crazy expensive. Uh, if you cannot develop the pipeline, you need uh, uh, ships to transport the, the hydrogen overseas, even more expensive. Uh, so what we try to do is to manufacture the hydrogen on site with electrolyzers and green hydrogen to store the hydrogen on site. And when we need electricity, the green hydrogen become electricity. So in a couple of words, when there is the sun, the PV plants will deliver electricity to the grid. With the oversize, we will charge the batteries and manufacture the green hydrogen. At the peak hours, the batteries will cover, uh, will cover the need for the grid. So in that example, uh, 5 to 8 p.m., for example, the, the, the battery will cover. For the whole night, the hydrogen will play a key role because it can deliver uh, electricity for endless amount of hours as long as you have uh, hydrogen available. Unlike the batteries, which has more limitation in terms of, uh, of time of services, of cycling, of performance also on the long run, as you can see with, uh, with your phone. The first year it works well, the second year, third year, it, it, you need to charge it more often. So it's, it's the same for the power plant in, in larger scale. So that's why we use both uh, batteries, hydrogen, but it's 100% green, uh, it's a stable power also. So now I will talk about uh, some references. Uh, it sounds very new when we talk about combining renewable energies, batteries, electrolyzers, fuel cells, and so on. But it's not that you, when you break down the system, you see that you have renewable energies on one hand, as we mentioned earlier, is not new. Batteries, not new neither, it's proven for a while. And the, the hydrogen scheme, it's divided in a three parts, production, storage, and production of electricity, is not new neither. Uh, chemical sector have been using hydrogen, have been producing hydrogen with electrolyzers for, for decades, if not a century. And the same for the fuel cell for mobility sector. They, they have been using fuel cell not on massive, massive scale, but at least they have been using fuel cells for a while, for cars, buses. So the technologies are not, new, are not new. And in this project in France, we were able to meet financial clues with commercial banks. So basically, we implemented this project uh, the way we do uh, solar plants with batteries. The fact 
its hydrogen doesn't change anything on the way it's structured and the way it's financed. And it is on the island grid at the edge of the system. This is the typical of example of the, the, the type of context we addressed. So we are duplicating these projects uh, uh, worldwide. For example, in Indonesia, we are developing a pipeline of more than 20 projects. We are targeting Eastern Indonesia, basically the areas where the cost of electricity is high, where the logistic is a nightmare. It's, um, it's an ideal uh, context for all type of projects. And with the support of development banks, so we are the headquarter of uh, ADB today. ADB is part of the project through technical assistance. Uh, and indeed, players like ADB, USDFC may play a role on uh, financing the debt of such uh, of such projects. So that is for for Indonesia. Uh, then Philippines, we are in Philippines today. Uh, same story than with Indonesia, uh, archipelago country, uh, large scale, uh, a lot of isolated grids or poorly interconnected. Here, this is a picture of Mindanao. We decided to start by Mindanao uh, because kind of remote areas, even though most people forget uh, Mindanao itself is uh, 28 million people, so more than Australia. Uh, so we can imagine the potential for growth of Mindanao, the challenge there on the peninsula of uh, Zamboanga on the west side of the, of the map. So that also is an ideal context for HDF. Uh, we have a couple of guys on the ground to work with local government units, electric cooperative, uh, governors to start uh, looking at potential sites, uh, studies to bring hydrogen and hence renewable energies also on those uh, territories. Uh, we expect, uh, we, we met interesting milestones uh, the last uh, weeks in Davao and in the coming days and weeks, we are working on key next steps too. And that again, it's a way to bring uh, uh, hydrogen into Indonesia and Philippines because those two countries won't be able to uh, subsidize the French, Japanese, or whatever firms to make hydrogen. So we need to bring added value. Last but not least, to, to, to bring another type of example of the kind of context we address, although not, not from Asia, this is in Africa. Uh, so in South Africa, the country is depending massively on coal, uh, as you may know, so similar than, uh, than most, country of, most countries of the region. Um, the dependence of coal is massive. There is a lot of international pressure to help South Africa uh, to switch from coal to renewables. And uh, we are bringing some added value to the country by proposing those, uh, what we call renew stable power plants, both renewable and stable to, to help to replace the coal. Because coal is a base load power. You cannot replace it by intermittent power. You need something base load. And this is what we bring with, uh, uh, with hydrogen. And here my contact for the ones uh, who want to reach out. Uh, well, I was pleased to bring today some example on how we can make something concrete, how we can be positive about hydrogen and not doing PowerPoint for the coming 20 years. So nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think fantastic examples, I'm sure, um, which um, I think demonstrate great relevance to the to the markets that we're focusing here uh, in ACF. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be some questions um, later on. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mirdula uh, Bagwan. She's going to come and talk uh, to us, I think, from the perspective of, uh, of solar, from the Solar Alliance. Um, so thank you for your time. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like to thank ASAF and the session organizers for this kind invite. Um, if you could load my presentation, please. Thank you. So I'm basically going to um, talk about the Global Hydrogen Innovation Center, which um, International um, Solar Alliance 
is partnering with the G20-2023 um, presidency this year. Uh, but before that, I would like to introduce um, the newest program of green hydrogen added into the um, list of ISA programs. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, um, the latest program um, on green hydrogen that was added to ISA um, in the 2021 assembly, our annual assembly. And the, the main focus of this program is to accelerate uh, solar hydrogen production, utilization, and trade across the borders and um, in the ISA member countries. So as we speak, we have 115 ISA member countries and they, um, they are categorized into three or four regions, um, Latin America, Europe and, Europe and others. And then the third one is Asia Pacific and Africa. So we have 115 membership as of now. So it gives us big platform to um, work on this. So um, ADB supports through its knowledge and um, support TA to ISA um, in many ISA activities and green hydrogen is one of those. And the support and assessment, uh, basically we, um, this program, we support the member countries and assessment and um, facilitation of solar hydrogen readiness level um, by doing these five verticals. First is enabling policy and regulatory framework. As you know, this is really important in this new sector. There are a lot of uh, you know, policy and regulations which need to be in place to, have, uh, to ensure uh, large scale deployment. The second is identifying technology gaps and go to resources. Now technology gaps are important because the people from electrolyzer uh, segment would know that there are different kinds of electrolyzers. Some are uh, time and tested, a few are upcoming and, um, and some, some of them have pros and cons related to uh, you know, different um, uh, performance um, um, requirements. So with, with that, we have a lot of technology gaps to be filled. And then we identify go-to resources in those areas. And being ISA being giving a big platform, it's easy to map the uh, resources across our membership. And the third is facilitating investment environment for commercially viable solar hydrogen projects. As Matthew just um, very beautifully covered that what's required on that side. So I will not go deep into this. The fourth is identification of viable projects pipeline across solar hydrogen value chain. And the fifth is creating global synergies. Again, because we have a huge membership, it, it's important for us to create and provide to the stakeholders across the value chain, the global synergies and leveraging partnerships with public and private sector. Think it's not moving forward. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is just, we all know that green hydrogen will play a role in decarbonization of hard to abate sectors. And this is just an example of, from the IEA report that H2 demand has potential to grow more than 300% by 2050. So we have a huge um, potential coming up in terms of demand and the cost of electrolyzer is expected to reduce sharply. And this makes the green hydrogen um, a, a potential um, energy vector to look for. Again, uh, it's important that we prioritize the applications of green hydrogen. And this is just a um, demonstration of what is where it becomes unavoidable, like the fertilizer, shipping, long haul aviation, and where it's still uncompetitive at the lower end of the table. Again, the, uh, the, as we know, the geopolitical conflict, um, we have um, um, the, the um, green hydrogen being inherently modular, and then the natural gas price fluctuations are quite uh, volatile. It makes the, um, you know, um, the, it, the whole thing will drive down the cost of electrolyzer and then it will become viable. This is the perceived notion. 
now I'll talk about the center we are creating under um, the um, G20. Um, just to brief, briefly tell you that we have done, we launched in the COP last year, um, Green Hydrogen Ecosystem Readiness Framework, ISIADB combined work, uh, where we have um, shortlisted around eight to 10 screening parameters. And we uh, use this framework basically to um, evaluate a set of 115 our member countries, not the whole lot, but around 37 to 40 countries we evaluated using that framework. And we categorized into um, four different categories, front runners, um, progressives, prospectives, and potential. This report is on our website and it's um, downloadable. Um, this kind of uh, prepares the country to self assess itself or evaluate itself in determining where they, where they are in, on, on the green hydrogen roadway. These are the reports that were launched in COP last year, and they are on our website, gives uh, entire uh, methodology in detail. Now, this is the um, center um, I wanted to mention. Uh, this is ISA is supporting G20, as I mentioned, in creating a center of excellence. Now, um, ADB, of course, is supporting ISA in this. And um, as countries develop green hydrogen ecosystems, there is a necessity for a knowledge repository. And most of the currently existing hydrogen portals, um, I have a map of those, um, talk about hydrogen across the colors or origins. They are blue, gray, blue, black, green. But what we plan to do here under the G20 partnership is to create a dedicated green hydrogen portal. And it has uh, it's aimed to be a one-stop uh, gateway to get all the necessary um, knowledge and uh, tracking the case studies, progress, and launching, um, giving opportunity for startup launches, and also train, giving certified training courses. And this is the uniqueness of this portal. Um, the creation of this Green Hydrogen Innovation Center with the name of our Center of Excellence um, is basically provide three main pillars of support, which is knowledge dissemination, best practices and learning, network and partners, and um, so we aim uh, to make this portal a go-to portal and entire energy community will benefit from GHIC because it has all the information available and it, it's dynamically, um, it's planned to be dynamic and we will have ear-to-ear -ear, um, progress and um, uh, tracked on this. And this will be hosted on the ISA website. So even when the presidency shifts to next country by this year end, it will continue to assist our members through this portal. This is the my second last slide. Um, so the unique features, I would like to in introduce two or three different things here, which are not existing elsewhere. One is the global startup incubation platform. There are startups offered elsewhere as well, but we have very clear um, uh, sort of blueprint being developed of different steps involved in this. Uh, creation of global li uh, startup library to make the new startups comfortable is one the first step and the, the registration is being launched um, as I speak on the ISA website. And then we will have um, um, our um, MDBs and I, uh, you know, IFIs partners, uh, you know, looking for good ideas to fund and uh, then it'll go forward. And then by March next year, we'll have announcements of the grants for the startups. The second is the skill development and e-learning courses, uh, which are certified are one of the important aspects that we plan to launch through this portal. And we will have a very good um, training agencies and training partners and also certification giving academic institutes because ISA cannot provide certificates. We have to tie up with academic institutes. So we are building that. And then very soon we will be launching that. This portal, uh, by the way, is being launched in the July ministerial of G20. So with this, I will end my presentation. My 10 minutes are over. These are just the screenshot of the portal. And the way forward is, as I mentioned, different areas of the portal. We are working on it. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to mention that we have KPMG support in uh, building this portal. They have the web developing team and also technical teams to work with us. 
Thank you very much, Ridella. I think, and Dan, um, sitting here somewhere, had his fingerprints on that um, presentation as well. Um, I think excellent in terms of the preparation. I think it's, a, it's again a good set, setting the scene for us. Um, we'd like then to jump into the, one of the big markets in into India, and um, uh, we could ask uh, Gurpreet uh, Chug to come up, managing director of uh, India ICF, not 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 IFC. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me well? Brilliant. So I'm pleased to be here and seeing so many faces after lunch. Actually, I quite enjoyed Hans's presentation right after lunch. Uh, all the questions that he asked, a nice wake up call right after a heavy lunch for those of you who had. But you've got to ask the questions and then the answers will come. And I think uh, my attempt is going to answer some of the questions around hydrogen. It's a fledgling fuel, but it has a bright future. So. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I work for ICF um, and uh, you know, it's not about who or what ICF is. I want to introduce ICF by what we do. Uh, we work in sectors that matter in, around the world. For the last 50 years, we've been supporting our clients in issues that matter, in issues that matter to ICFers and the people, 9,000 people that we have that are passionate about all these issues. We are climate conscious. We are probably among the first few professional firms that went carbon neutral in 2005. So that's ICF. If you want to know more about us, you're welcome to talk to me. So hydrogen, coming to hydrogen, uh, I'm going to talk about clean hydrogen. Uh, people are calling it the fuel of the future. I call it back to the future. Why do I say that? You know, Hans mentioned that in 1900s, there was work on hydrogen. But if you go back to 1800s, hydrogen was the first fuel to be used in the internal combustion engine, a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. So it's, it's an old fuel, it's been around, we're just getting to know better about its possibilities and learning about it. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, there's a varied nomenclature, even I get confused by the various colors, you know, I love all these colors. Uh, there's green, blue, turquoise, pink, and so on, and the list continues. But the focus really is on clean hydrogen and the emissions that come out of those. The advantages of hydrogen are well known, uh, and that's the reason why all countries are looking at hydrogen as a potential fuel. It's renewable, near zero emissions, provides a lot of energy security, and that's an important point for countries like India and other import-dependent countries, and I'll come to that in subsequent slides. Energy, it provides local energy security as well, and it provides a solution for hard to wait sectors. As I said, the world is just waking up to hydrogen. The growth in the last few years has been limited, but we believe that the future is exponentially higher. Many countries around the world are taking different initiatives. They are taking targets, whether these are volume targets or these are price targets. Around the world, you see announcements where companies are saying we are targeting certain volumes of hydrogen. Now you might of course want to evaluate all of these and say, do you have the resources uh, to be able to meet these commitments? Do you have the volumes of renewable energy if it's going to be uh, all greed? Yes, these are challenges. But I do think about the example of India when in 2014, we took a bold target of 175 gigawatt of renewables um, and nobody thought it was possible. Well, we reached 120. You can look at it and say the glass is half empty or we missed by 50, but you can look at it and say we were at 20 and we are today at 120 in a matter of seven years. We've grown five times. That's an achievement to talk about. And I think these targets serve that purpose. They are like a wake up call. And these are important to be set by the people in position to wake up the industry, to get everyone going and get working towards achieving some of these objectives. Coming to India, uh, many of you may already know, India is today already the third largest producer and consumer of hydrogen in the world, just after China and the USA. Majority of the hydrogen consumption in India comes from two sectors, refining and fertilizer. In refining, it's used for uh, improving the fuel quality and desulfurizing it. In fertilizer, used as ammonia. In both these places, if you see, it's produced locally using natural gas, steam reforming process. But if you see the graph on the left, that yellow, uh, the, the blue bit on top, is the merchant sales. So there is already a market that exists where hydrogen is sold and bought. 
mostly the byproduct which is being produced in chemical sector it's sold and it's purchased so there is a trade of hydrogen already happening and there is a market there may not be a single market at a single price but there is a commercial trade for hydrogen already happening so if we look at india's demand forecast and this is done by our team based in new delhi it's a, you know we've done a bottom up analysis of every sector which can potentially consume uh, hydrogen and we've looked at um, all the big sectors like refining and fertilizer but all the other sectors like industries as well methanol glass and so on and so forth and we've gone and looked at each and every district in india and mapped the demand and on that basis uh, you know in we believe that from 6 to 7 million tons today uh, we might end up anywhere between 15 to 25 million tons of demand for hydrogen by 2040 based on different assumptions different assumptions around economic growth different assumptions around cost reductions and different assumptions around policies that the government might have to support development of hydrogen in the region but certainly that's um, a large market uh, anywhere between 2 and 1/2 to 4 times growth from where we are today to 2040 what does it mean for suppliers it means it's a big market uh, if you look at the two lines there the one in green is the green hydrogen line which initially takes a bit of time as per our forecast to pick up but then by 2035 and 40 uh, once it picks up and once the industry ecosystem is set the market size for green hydrogen in india could be anywhere between 30 to 35 billion of annual revenues for companies that are producing and selling hydrogen green hydrogen in india imagine just a 1% share of that is 300 million dollars annual revenue so it has a large potential for suppliers to wake up take notice and address the market because the demand is definitely there and it's growing some of you might say that oh this is you know very uh, bullish demand forecasts but let me remind you the growth that we are going to see in india in energy consumption over the next 30 40 years even our most optimistic demand forecast means that we'll probably not even reach 5% of the energy mix from hydrogen which brings me back to the point that was raised in the first presentation that hydrogen is definitely a part of solution but there are many other things that are needed to solve the complicated energy requirements puzzle that there it's it's a piece in the jigsaw uh, but a very important one another thing i wanted to share with all of you uh, is perhaps you already know but uh, on the basis of demand estimates that we did you see a map of india here uh, we have a gis data of demand centers across india by 2040 and what 2040 shows us um, if you see the circles these are the refineries the triangles these these are the fertilizer plants they are the large demand centers for hydrogen going forward and if you see the color coding of the different states dark green represents the states where there's going to be high demand and light green where there is less demand so you see on the west side and then the middle portion and you know on the southeast portion there go these are the states which where there are going to be high demand centers for uh, hydrogen uh, we believe that supply centers perhaps also need to come in the same region to meet this demand given all the challenges around transportation and therefore the hubs hydrogen hubs or hydrogen valleys make eminent sense for india to look at regions and promote hydrogen manufacturing or green hydrogen manufacturing in the regions where there are large demand centers talking very briefly about uh, transport i'm not going to delve into it all of you know it's very difficult and costly to transport hydrogen as it is it is a very sparse or, or you know a, a, a gas which takes a lot of um, compression uh, and then still uh, the volume that you compress volume to weight ratio is not as good as any of the other gases if you liquefy it's again very difficult you need to reach minus 250 degrees centigrade lng is already at minus 160 degrees uh, it's difficult to manage the industry knows how to manage it but imagine reaching 250 degrees and keeping it at minus 250 degrees for transport it's it's very complicated and costly so what starts to make sense if you've got to transport probably you look at ammonia and you look at uh, liquid organic hydrocarbon carriers but effectively the solutions have to come up where production has to be nearer to the demand centers or if you convert it to ammonia in places where ammonia can be directly used as a fuel or as a feedstock it starts to make sense converting it back to hydrogen of course is a complicated and a costly process through cracking not yet not yet well established 
Economics are always very important. And here I have two potential uh, pictures, uh, the economics of green hydrogen versus any other form, say gray hydrogen, will depend on certain key parameters like fuel prices, fossil fuel prices. When natural gas prices are high, it's easier uh, for green hydrogen to compete. And otherwise, it makes it slightly more difficult. But most importantly, it's the government support that can provide initiatives in the early years to support green hydrogen and become uh, and make it become more uh, economically competitive. Talking about incentives, Indian government is indeed providing certain incentives. I want to talk, there are many policies, but I want to talk about two of them. The first one is National uh, Hydrogen Mission, which was launched in 2021 and updated in 2023. There is a budget outlay of $2.4 billion already provided to this. So this mission is funded and it aims at 5 million tons of production capacity by 2020, 2030 of green hydrogen and expects about $100 billion of investments coming in. The green hydrogen policy on the other side is to support the renewable energy that has to come and needed for green hydrogen and reduce the cost of renewable energy through providing certain incentives. Finally, what's in it for the government? We believe it's a win-win because locally produced green hydrogen can help the government achieve about 15 to 20 billion of savings in fossil fuel imports. And that is a big burden on Indian government and many other developing countries which are today importing crude. And it kind of com completely uh, destroys the um, fiscal position when the oil prices go up. Finally, uh, so what are the key takeaways that you know I'd like to leave you with? Uh, five key points. Uh, we expect the demand for hydrogen in India to increase substantially by 2040. However, it will still be a minor component of the energy mix. We believe supply will come online because there's a large market to tap and there are suppliers already like HDF Energy, which is already looking at these markets and many more. Transport will remain a challenge and therefore the hubs concept where production is near to the demand centers will make sense. Economics are very important, but will depend on government incentive as well as market drivers and technology improvement. And finally, for the government, if they can achieve a lot of um, foreign exchange savings, if they were to look at locally produced hydrogen uh, instead of fossil fuel imports. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, finish my presentation. Thank you so much. I know it's been flashing for a minute or so. Uh, I'm over time, but thank you. Thank you very much, Gerbord. A very much work in progress and a big picture there. I think uh, we'll enjoy sharing over some questions. Um, the last presentation, uh, back to the islands, if I could ask Dr. Uh, Romano Pakadan, Technical Director, Power Specialist, um, in, to talk about, I think, important partnerships between Indonesia and, and, uh, and the UK government in, in the rollout there. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I just would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Romeo Pakudan. I'm from the Philippines, but in the past 30 years, I was just, just like any other Filipinos, I work abroad. Uh, I, I moved to the UK uh, two years ago, but before that, I, I spent nine years as uh, leading the policy think tank of the Brunei government on sustainable energies. So uh, uh, I was with the uh, Prime Minister's office uh, since 2012, and then in 2021, I moved to uh, the UK. And before that, I was also a researcher at the uh, Riso National Laboratory in Denmark. Uh, it used to be a nuclear research facility in, in, in Denmark. Uh, the, uh, I represent, uh, I, I, I'm one of the technical directors of Ricardo Energy Environment, and Ricardo is actually it's a huge a consulting firm, and we are actually manufacturing the engines for several uh, uh, cars in, in the UK. And we are also involved in, in several hydrogen projects in the, uh, in, in the UK and, and some in Europe. But what I'll be sharing today is our experience, uh, recent experience in Indonesia. So uh, we were asked by the government to assist them developing the national hydrogen strategy. And I think it was really appropriate that Hans Henning started the, the presentation because he asked a lot of questions. And the first answer is that we need to plan. 
we need to plan, we need to develop a strategy because we cannot just indiscriminately use hydrogen. And this is what I'm going to share. And, 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 and is this the one? Yeah, or here? Okay. Oh, so it's, oh, it should be moving, moving back, yeah. So I'll not mention about the company, but you can find it in the, in the website. Uh, it's a big uh, engineering consulting firm. We started actually in the UK by building, uh, in the first world war, building the engines for the military tanks of the, uh, of the British government. And uh, yeah, so I'll be, I'll be sharing with you uh, the, the process that we have gone through in supporting the Indonesian government to develop their national strategy. I will not be presenting the Indonesian strategy because they will be announcing it at the end of this month. There will be a hydrogen summit in Bali and they will launch the national hydrogen strategy. But what I'll be doing here is just to go through the process that we have done for them to develop the national hydrogen strategy. By the way, I just would like to emphasize the color, but I would like to, to show this picture is actually in Brunei Jerusalem. Uh, I was still there when they developed the, the demonstration project uh, together with Japanese, Japanese uh, corporation. It's, it's not the hydrogen, it's a gray hydrogen, but it's not on the, the demonstration project is not on the production of hydrogen. It's actually on the supply, long-term transportation of hydrogen. And in this case, we're not using ammonia in that case, we're using the MCH technology. Yeah methyl cyclohexane, but eventually the, the, the conclusion is that it's cheaper to transport via ammonia process. In this case, the hydrogen, we mix it with toluene and it becomes neutral and we put it in vessels and then we ship it by local shipping uh, companies. It goes to Singapore and it goes to Japan. Reaching Japan, they remove the toluene and then take the hydrogen and then return back the toluene using the, the normal uh, shipping uh, route in that case. But eventually the the winning technology is shipping it through ammonia. So the question is that uh, we really need to we really need to plan. We need to strategize because it's we cannot just use hydrogen indiscriminately. And when we supported the government, we carried out all this background review and we do the broad scanning of different policies, and then we. We, we, we organize focus group discussions with different stakeholders for them to be aware on what's been going on in terms of hydrogen development and strategies for different countries in the world. And then uh, they ask us to identify which sectors that we need to prioritize for hydrogen development. And we follow this hydrogen hierarchy. We develop a hydrogen hier hierarchy for Indonesia, but I will not be presenting them. It, it belongs to the, to, the, to the Indonesian government, but I'll be presenting here the Scottish Hydrogen Action Plan. So the whole idea is that you need to identify uh, applications or utilization that doesn't have any alternatives. If you, use, uh, if you use applications with several alternative fuels, it would be better it would be better to use uh, the alternative fuels because to produce green hydrogen, we call it green molecules. We need to produce. Uh, you need to 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 produce uh, green electrons first. You know, green electricity. There's already an efficiency loss, and then you convert it into hydrogen. There's a lot of efficiency loss there, and then you produce energy again. So it's efficiency-wise, it's relatively low and the cost of producing it is relatively high. So uh, we need to identify, we need to strategize, not all applications we can use hydrogen. Well, the UK approach or is just looking to the hydrogen hierarchy or we develop hydrogen hierarchy for Indonesia, but the, the, the German approach is you can also use a sort of a, the matrix, like what are the new regrets application? What are the controversial application and what could be the bad idea for the utilization of hydrogen in that case. So when we help them develop the concept of the strategy, the question is that why is it uh, the hydrogen economy is not developing? So we look into the problem tree analysis and saying that why is that happening? One of the reasons is that 
there's a market failure. And that's a reason why you really ask the government to intervene, the government to, to, to intervene because there are market failures. And, and we identify what are the root causes of this uh, non-development of the hydrogen economy. And then uh, from, from the, 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 the problem, the causes and the effects, we convert it into objectives and it becomes an objective tree. And from the objective tree, we identified uh, all those problems, we converted it into results. And the results, desired results. And when we identified all those desired results, we group them or lump them together in terms of what are those desired results that will contribute to the creation of the market. The other one is that what are those uh, decide results that will strengthen the energy security and energy sovereignty. And then what are those decide results that uh, supports the export of hydrogen? And then we have all those elements. And the question now is that, okay, these are the decide results. Why it's, what, what, what are the challenges? What are the barriers? What are the market failures? And then we try to identify what are the specific measures? So those specific measures are actually a component of the strategy. And of course, I will not mention, we will wait for the Indonesian government to release the national strategy by the end of, by the end of this month. So that's how the process uh, in, uh, that we have uh, uh, followed when we developed the, the strategy for Indonesia. And then we use the theory of change framework to visualize the hydrogen economy. So we say that, okay, these are the desired impacts, the goal, outcome, outputs, activities, and what are the uh, market failures, the barriers that we try to address in, 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 this, in this strategy. And then of course, after developing this uh, uh, theory of change framework, we use also uh, this framework to develop our monitoring framework. So it's a long-term monitoring framework, monitoring or progress. So in the next, one year, two years, and three years, what are the indicators that we would like to check in order to, uh, to, to, to see the success of our, our strategy, okay? Uh, by the way, I just would like to return back. One of the, one of the strategy, strategies here is actually to, 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 to develop uh, or to, 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 to generate hydrogen for off-grid systems. And I think this is actually what uh, Matthew uh, was presenting er earlier as, as an option. But um, our partner actually, by the way, uh, we were funded by the UK Pact. And then our partner, the local partner, uh, was funded by the FCDO, uh, the, 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 the British Embassy in, in Jakarta. And they were asked by PLN, the state util utility, they were asking the question whether hydrogen is an option for uh, off-grid systems. And quickly, I just would like to show uh, the analysis that we have done. They gave us one island as a case study, and then they asked us, can you assess whether it's economically viable to uh, do hydrogen uh, in this island? So it's it, one big island, there are three sites, there are microgrids, there are uh, supported by diesel generators. And we look into the resources, there's geothermal energy resource and there's only solar energy resource as well. And then uh, what we did is that we, we tried to identify what are the different solutions, whether a centralized system, a geothermal energy or a battery storage or the green hydrogen. And, the, and then we, we, we run a simulation analysis to get an optimal configuration to meet the demand uh, 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 for, for each specific uh, microgrid. And the, the, the government asked us, when would be the hydrogen option ec economical? So we, we look into the technological learning curves and then we put it in our model. And then we run simulation analysis and we get results in terms of what would be the cheapest option for uh, those microgrids. Of course, the centralized system is, is the cheapest option, geothermal energy. But the point is that for a small island, the capital cost investment would be very, very high and the demand is relatively very, very low. So 
For other islands with no geothermal energy, your option would be battery storage and hydrogen, green hydrogen option. And uh, we run for 2024. If you develop the project now, you have the, if you develop now, the project will be operational next year. And then uh, what would be the, 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 the levelized cost? And then we run it also for 2030 using the technological uh, learning curves uh, in that case. And what is interesting is that the LCOAs using a green hydrogen will converge to that of battery. It's interesting. By 2030, it will become closer. Of course, there are some uncertainty in our, in our analysis, but the point is that towards the end of this decade, green hydrogen will be competitive with battery storage. In that case. This is very, very interesting. And then we, 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 we did this ADB type uh, economic analysis, and the conclusion is more or less the same. And what is interesting is that by 2030, green hydrogen will be already economical for island grids. So our, our, our conclusion is that green hydrogen with its projected technological learning will become an economically viable option for island microgrids towards the end of this decade. And it will form part of the technology mix to decarbonate, decarbonize nation's economy. So, so what I would like to say is that, uh, well, probably there are some differences with our calculation with Matthew, but the point is that, uh, the point is that um, we use the average uh, costs, international figures, but there is a high and low. Maybe Matthew, they have figures on the lower side where they could get probably a, 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 a sort of a, a more, uh, more economical result, even if it is closer to 2025 or 2026, or even not waiting for the next uh, five years. And, uh, and I would like to say that, uh, Yes, uh, we, we need to strategize, we need to help the governments, and especially in these parts of the world, especially smaller islands, Pacific islands, or in the Philippines, we need to help the government. We need to help the likes of Matthew and other investors to come in and invest by developing a national strategy and by guiding them on which direction that they should go and what would be the incentives that they will get in order to uh, realize the hydrogen economy. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Romeo. I think they're fantastic. Um, 2030, 2040 on some of the timelines that I think that have, that have been presented. What I, I, I'm hoping, I, I think that was a very good uh, overview. I think we had some great um, presentations there that took us, I guess, through, gave us a number of perspectives on it. Um, this is uh, an issue that's going to present throughout these ACFs now, I think, into well into the future, it's obvious. Um, and so what we'd like to try and do, I think, is distill some of the questions I'm sure these presentations have raised and try and put a little bit more light on the subject of hydrogen when and where and how um, from our speakers. We've got, uh, if I could ask each of the speakers to come back in addition to Teddy from UNIDO, uh, that would be useful. I'm, I'm actually putting everyone up, Steve, is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Just while we're getting a little settled, I'd just ask for the normal courtesies, if we could, um, just people, uh, questions coming from the floor, just to quickly identify yourself. And I think if you can help us a little bit uh, by pointing um, to who you're directing the question, that would be fairly we have, useful. We have one from the app um, from Alan Kay. The introduction stated hydrogen is not the way to decarbonize, but most countries have started hydrogen is critical stated hydrogen is critical to decarbonization. Can this be explained in a, a why the introduction stated this? Uh, so would you like me to answer? Alan, where are you? Is Alan in the audience? Alan K? No? Okay, so we'll go to another question. This is from Norbert. Um, is hydrogen technology already used in energy transportation, i.e. replacing high voltage transmission lines? 
So perhaps you might ask one of those questions, Alan, uh, um, Mark. Is hydrogen technology already used in the for energy transportation, i.e., replacing uh, high voltage transmission lines? I think this is talking about uh, battery storage. Yeah. Uh Can you all hear me? So I'm, I'm not sure I got the full question, but maybe it was around transporting hydrogen or uh, replacing power transmission. Well, okay. Um, well, I think in the broad con concept, you know, hydrogen is an energy carrier, but the question really is about what do you want to transport? You want to transport something that is easy, cheap, convenient to transport. Today, hydrogen is very difficult to transport. Even if you convert it into green ammonia or liquid organic hydrocarbon, transporting that is not cost effective compared to transporting electricity. So, uh, you know, as far as my understanding goes, I think transporting electricity uh, for long distances remains uh, a solution that will be with us for a long time. Hydrogen transport will perhaps be very expensive until, you know, we mm -hmm. discover some breakthrough technology. So hydrogen, hydrogen is not the ideal uh, energy carrier for long distances. Uh, it's best to use hydrogen where it is, um, generate hydrogen where it is needed. I hope. I hope that answers the question. I hope so. I was just wondering, I mean, given your target scope of, of uh, 20, 45% still this for the hydrogen production, it's unlikely to be um, replicating transmission in any time soon. Okay, do we have some questions from the floor? Come up to the speaker and just identify here, thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Travis. I'm a PhD student over at the uh, University of Philippines, the School of Urban and Regional Planning. And I've been working in uh, hydrogen for quite some time now, uh, including on the ground development for large hydrogen production in Malaysia. Uh, one of the questions I have specifically for the Philippines is, uh, it seems that the regulatory and policy framework here seems to be lacking some of the other countries. And uh, I wonder if any of you have any perspectives on the current status and the way forward to help the Philippines in that area. Thank you. Matthew, I'm wondering whether given your work in Mindanao, you have had a chance to reflect on policy there. Yeah, so, so this topic is indeed critical. Uh, if we don't know what is the regulation, how to develop, how to implement the project, uh, that would be very complicated to have money from the banks. Without the banks, there, there won't be any projects. But that being said, uh, the challenge you underlined uh, for Philippines uh, is the same worldwide. Uh, well, in Asia, but also in Europe, you can check. I'm French, so I will take the example for France. You can check about what is the French regulation about hydrogen and green hydrogen. Uh, you, you may spend a long time on it and you won't find much. While we did a commercial scale project uh, in green hydrogen. So I would be unable to advise uh, DOE or whatever about what to do uh, on the Philippines. Uh, I think there are great experts to do that. But what I see is that when we propose something new and which makes sense, economically speaking, technically, we should always find solutions uh, to see how it fits with the existing framework. For example, what we cannot do, when I say we as the industry, is to wait and hope for a new regulation to be perfect and to address our projects because we may wait forever, uh, but we, we need to investigate how uh, it fits with the existing framework. Like, can we, can we be an exception to the existing rule? Maybe the development institutions have a, a role to play also uh, because for the private sector, it's difficult to lead uh, such topics while the development banks can play an independent role by advising the government and how to make the first uh, projects happen. Can I, can I add something, Mark? Mark, can I, can I add something? Yeah, yeah please sure. go ahead, Roma, uh, Romeo. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's our proposal, and we, we, we would like to team up with ADB to, to, to develop 
develop a case study for other ADB member countries if we could develop a strategy here in the Philippines or probably in the in the Pacific Islands. And the point is that it's really difficult for investors if you don't have a clear policy. And I think what is required for the Department of Energy is to issue a circular as similar to that of renewable energy. And they have to define, uh, but, but, but the point as well is that they need to identify what would be the optimal uh, application for, uh, for hydrogen. You cannot just say hydrogen for everything. Hydrogen, you need to identify all those, and we need to do that study for the government. So we're, we were, were interested to team up with ADB and any donor organization, probably UNIDO, if we could support the governments in the region. Currently, we have only Singapore, I think they have the hydrogen strategy. And I'm not sure about Malaysia, but uh, well, Indonesia, they will be releasing soon. And hopefully we could see Matthias project uh, be launched in, in Indonesia in that case. Thank you. Thank you, Romeo. Um, you just come up to the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Ed El Rahal, and I work on a USAID project in Bangladesh. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, what about the state of the use of hydrogen in Japan? It seems like during the opening session, uh, we had a very positive uh, presentation on what's going on in Japan with respect of, uh, you know, hydrogen uh, uh, power generation. Can anybody comment on that? I mean, there was no mention uh, to anything that's going on in Japan uh, during this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can say a little bit about it. Uh, Japan is my second home. Uh, I'm German, but I've been living longer in Japan than in Germany. So um, I think Japan is currently following uh, a way of hopium, uh, of hope and opium, mixture hopium. Yeah, uh, I think what they are planning is uh, transporting hydrogen in liquid form from Australia to Japan. And the first one already had, a, had quite substantial problems. It's technically very, very difficult. Uh, if I would be politician in Japan, I would recommend that they push for a, a DC line under under sea line from Western Australia and supplying uh, electricity directly to Japan. Converting it into uh, hydrogen will be a very very difficult task, very difficult. And in the country, you know, we we have almost no hydrogen filling station and nothing. It's it's a it's a tough start really tough start. Thank you. Uh, I think the DC line is, is a big ambition, um, Hans, but we're flat out getting one across to Tasmania at the moment. So good luck with Japan. Yeah, and just to, to bring something positive, if I may, um, the, the specificity of Japan is uh, it's an island with little natural resources. And uh, in the energy mix, there is not only electricity. So we can bring a cable, even though Let's assume it's uh, financially and technically doable. It won't be enough to decarbonize the whole country. The advantage of Japan is that they have this dependence from abroad about oil and gas, and they can afford replacing uh, oil and gas by green hydrogen. I think I agree it's expensive to develop the infrastructure to do what the sector did in LNG decades ago. But if one country can afford it, this is Japan. So hopefully, they are serious and they will help the first projects to, to materialize. I just would like to add about, uh, well, in Japan, they, they, they already ex expressed that they, they really would like to import hydrogen from most uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries, and including Australia in that case. And then during one of our focus dis uh, discussions in, uh, that's three weeks ago in Jakarta, there is this one Japanese company and he was really aggressively saying that we're going to import ammonia and we would like to produce ammonia from, from Indonesia and they're looking for the cheaper electricity and that points to geothermal energy and they're trying to identify with, with where are those geothermal where are those geothermal energy as sites, uh, geothermal sites that they can produce cheaper electricity? The, the main difficulty for them is that they are more on the ammonia production. So what they're saying is that we, we need an IPP who will produce that at a very, very low price of geothermal energy. So uh, 
we we hope that they will be able to get uh, some of those uh, some of those geothermal power plants. The the point as well is that when we develop the strategy, there's always the point of these renewable energy additionality. So the point is that in Indonesia, they have already planned for renewable energy roadmap. And the point is that those renewable energy roadmap, they are already identified for different utilization, not hydrogen production. So if, we, if you would like to develop uh, hydrogen production or exports for hydrogen, it should be on top of the existing renewable energy strategy. So they need to review their, their regional uh, renewable energy roadmap and to look into the domestic application because it's cheaper to use, re use uh, renewable energy electricity directly. So the point is that the, the, the renewable energy for hydrogen production should be on top of the existing strategy so it triggers development of renewable energy but it could be a challenge as well for 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 the country and the government thank you hi good afternoon Raza Farooq from adb um, apparently it looks like it's not that an easy solution either we need to have operators to produce it at a location where we need the electricity because as uh, presenters uh, said that it's difficult to transport. So my question is, uh, how do we compare it with other renewables? For instance, uh, the solar is getting cheaper and cheaper day by day. So is there a comparison in terms of uh, per megawatt generation uh, of hydrogen and other? Why, would, why should we prioritize it or recommend it to a government that they should go towards hydrogen if there is no economic uh, benefit or it is if it is difficult to produce it or transport it yeah I, I can take that so I think that's a great question and I think it's about um, which fuel what are what are you using hydrogen for and uh, the first use of hydrogen is unlikely to be large-scale electricity generation so perhaps comparing the cost of electricity produced from hydrogen versus electricity produced from renewable like solar or wind is may not be the right comparison right now. I think most of the countries are looking at hydrogen to replace the gray hydrogen to start with, and then the additional demand that might come from um, its use in ammonia and fertilizers. And here it's, you can't use electricity because it's a feedstock. So you need hydrogen to desulfurize and you need hydrogen to make ammonia through a chemical process. So the comparison there is between hydrogen price and say natural gas or LNG price. And that's where the comparison starts to make sense. If you're producing this hydrogen in a cost-effective manner, say you're producing it from renewable energy, which costs say, you know, five cents or even lower in many geographies. In India, it's, you know, four cents maybe, or even lower. So if your renewable electricity is at low cost and your efficiency of electrolyzers is good, you can produce green hydrogen at competitive prices, especially when oil prices are high. So I think you need to look at the use of hydrogen and then compare what is it replacing. Initial stages, it will replace fossil fuels, and therefore that's the price comparison. In later stages, maybe 15, 20 years down the line, there might be technology which you know may, may make it much more versatile to directly generate electricity. But at the moment, I would say you know, that's maybe not the right comparison. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, we've got two questions from Garrick. Is Garrick in the audience? Do you want to ask them? Or do you want to come up and ask them? Why don't you come up and ask them? Yeah, so <clears throat> let's talk about um, transporting ammonia. Tell us where you're from, man. Um, I'm Garrick from uh, USAID Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership. So yeah, on transporting ammonia, there was a session before where someone mentioned that ammonia is extremely toxic. And if you were to expand the transport of ammonia around the world, you know, dramatically, that could potentially cause a lot of environmental issues. In the future, so it would be, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Um, it was also, the, my other question was about mini grids. There was talk about using it for rural island mini grids using hydrogen. And I'm wondering at what size or scale does it really make sense compared to say a solar battery mini grid? If anyone wants to comment on that, thanks. 
Um, I'm wondering whether Romeo, you've been giving this a bit of thought or, or perfect, whichever. Yeah, the, the result of my our calculation is that if there is renewable energy available, if you have hydro, small hydropower, use it for electrification. And uh, in areas in islands where you have limited renewable energy resources, like you have only solar, so you have the option of using battery storage or uh, producing hydrogen on site and then use it in the evening, you know. Yeah, you, you do the production during daytime and then uh, you do an optimis optimization uh, uh, analysis to determine what would be the optimal size for the, for the solar PV, the fuel cell electrolyzers and storage uh, tank in that case. Uh, the, 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 the indication of our analysis is very, very interesting is that by 2030 or towards 2030, the cost of, liberalized cost of uh, green hydrogen uh, compared with battery stores are more or less the same. So, or they become closer in that case and it, they become economic as well. So the point is that it's, it's just a policy choice in that case, or it, it, it depends on the investor. It's just like developing wind or developing solar. They're all available in a certain place. And in that case, we're storing through uh, hydrogen tank or uh, uh, so, uh, using battery storage. So the projected technological learning shows that by 2030 or maybe 2035, they will be just be the same. So it's, it's a matter of the choice of technology in that case. Yeah, if I may, I will bring... Um, um, sorry, you, you go. Yeah. Okay. Because this is exactly what we address. So firstly, about the technology and the scale. Uh, the price is not the only topic. It's like real estate. Uh, when you ask a question, uh, was it the the, uh, the price of a house in Manila? Doesn't make sense at all. Uh, depends where you are in Manila. Depends on the, the size of the house. Battery or hydrogen is a bit the same. I mean, uh, but, and I will be straightforward. Uh, batteries are cheaper than hydrogen. There, there is no debate about that. But there are stuff that batteries cannot do and that hydrogen can do and vice versa. So our analysis is if you want to deliver power 24-7 at a high availability, the, the battery cannot do it. The battery, they have limitation of times. They will be good to uh, mitigate the impact of intermittent power to the grid, but not to deliver 100% of renewable energies to the grid. Uh, if you take the example of Germany, uh, Germany, they didn't switch off all nuclear power plants and coal power plants. They, they turned off the nuclear power plants, but they kept the coal power plants because you cannot integrate a lot of intermittent power to the grid. And then about the scale, there are the technical limitation, but also the limitation in terms of project finance scheme. There are people from uh, uh, finance institutions here. If you ask them if they can finance uh, projects of 500 kilowatt, I'm not sure they would be very happy with, with your projects. So that is an important parameter. Uh, if we look at Highland Grids, how can we make that sustainable in terms of finance structuration? Our approach is to start by a big project. Once we have the learning curve, we will look at a bundle of small scale projects to, to make it viable. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. No, okay. So, sorry, I, I, we've got only about a minute to go and I wanna just quickly wrap up if I can. We've got, I wanna give Matt and uh, Emmanuel from, uh, for the next session uh, enough to, time to prepare and get their speakers and, and things in order. But I, I'd like to just say um, it was fantastic panel. I think we, we got very good broad cross section uh, of thoughts and questions. Uh, it's obviously uh, the, the, the point in the, the transition of most interest. I think that the next few years of the, of the ASEF, we'll start to see where this rolls out. We'll start to see, I think what a lot of the speakers introduced is the planning, there's good planning happening. There is good um, regulatory thought processes. There's an understanding of where this fits and things tend to get pretty carried away. I think I can say that for my own country, it's a bit, um, I, I like uh, the analogy from hands. It's, it's a bit of a Swiss army knife, certainly down under and we're going to be a big exporter um, as we talked about with Japan and Korea, et cetera. Um, that, that's our plan, but 
when we get there is, is, an, is another question. We haven't really talked a lot about price. There's been some in, in talk, some introductions to that, but I think as we go forward next year, we'll, we'll get a stronger focus on just how this is gonna fit in a pricing sense. And I think importantly, what I liked about some of the presentations today was just um, identifying how it fits within our region, how it fits with the members uh, of the ADB, uh, the island, island countries or, or bigger, uh, countries in 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 its um, membership categories, so I think it's it's work in progress. That's the story. It's a big work in progress. It's a big part of what our future is going to be. But today, I think hopefully we we gave a good introduction. I think gave a good um, summary of where the key issues and things sat. So I'd just like to put my hands together and thank again the the speakers. They were they were really good presentation um, and and to the delegates many of you are from uh, quite a big attendance here which shows the interest in the subject matter I just conclude by um, acknowledging uh, Steve Peters um, many of you I know I'm a friend of his but but he's one of the guys that does work the floor he does get down out of the out of the floors above in the ADB and, and does constantly try and network and put people together so I think that's very commendable. And, and also, I just also acknowledge Philly down the back who pulled together the session um, and all of the things that go on behind it. So um, we, we thank them. The flying sign is flashing at me and, and please stay around for IRENA and, and, and uh, DNV, I think in the next session, which uh, hopefully builds on, um, it talks about a way forward, it builds on, I think the excellent platform that these guys today have, have, have spent time conveying to you. So th thank you very much, delegates. Thanks, Mark. So everybody, heart short break, and we'll see you back here in about half an hour. Thank you. I have to say that uh, some parts of the world uh, have uh, provided a lot of information, have made uh, some progresses, and many strategies have been published. The policymakers have taken certain stance. But when we talk about Asia, there, are, there is still a large white space. There is still an opportunity to drive a change, to comment on the change and to learn from Europe and the US and other countries. So the, the reason to have a panel today is to talk about what are the opportunities and the way forward for Asia. Uh, I have, uh, I'm very happy to have a very rich panel uh, with uh, Mats de Honda will uh, introduce uh, uh, the topic with uh, a bit more of knowledge on uh, the market uh, development in Asia. Um, Mr. Saren Chua, coming from uh, Singapore, will, uh, from the Energy Market Authority. Dr. Modno Hansnam, that is the Deputy Secretary General uh, for Mosti, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Song, Dr. of the Center of External Affairs and Policy Cooperation uh, from uh, South Korea, and also someone from the industry. Uh, I'm probably going to pronounce it very bad, uh, Nishant Balashangan, okay, representative from the Green Agenda organization from India. Now, but uh, before everything, I will let, uh, leave it to Peter Warren to make some introductory remarks. Thank you. Oh, that's a good way to go up the steps, trip up right at the beginning. Um, well, thanks uh, to the ADB for in inviting me to uh, present in uh, the hydrogen workshop. We're doing a lot of exciting uh, things in this space, and I want to cover it from particularly the international climate finance perspective. So I'm going to just present a few slides just to show you that particular dimension. It's not going to be a technical presentation about hydrogen. It's going to be about where are we putting, for example, aid money into clean hydrogen and where we've got some exciting new programs where we want to uh, try and push us as much across the Asia Pacific region uh, as possible. So it's a nice sort of segue between the first session and the second session. So hopefully um, you'll find this interesting. I see the slides are not on the screen, so I'm not sure if I need to do anything or <laughs> if that's for the guys behind the scenes. It's the guys behind the scenes, good. Um, I thought I'd just do one quick slide on what the UK is doing as well, in case that's of interest, uh, before we go into how we're working with other countries. Um, so we produced the hydrogen strategy. I know a number of countries have brought these out over the last few years. 
we published ours in, uh, in 2021. Um, we're also going to do sort of a, a, an update to that uh, in, the, in the coming years, but we've also produced last year an action plan. So trying to take that high level strategy uh, and put it into sort of practice. What are the, exactly the activities that we want to do? Um, but the overall ambition is up to 10 gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen uh, production by 2030. So that's where we want to try and get to. Um, there's also funding behind this. So we have a 20 million uh, competition um, so 20 million pounds for 35 million dollars or so. Um, for a hydrogen transport hub. So we're looking at hydrogen across lots of different sectors, but in this particular competition, we want to look at the use of hydrogen in transport. Um, we're doing a big focus on R&D, so research and development, demonstration. Uh, and when I talk about the international climate finance side, that also uh, applies uh, into, uh, into that space as well. Um, so to take the shift over to international climate finance, um, if anyone's interested in looking at this in more detail, um, the slides will be up on the ASEF uh, website um, at some point uh, when that gets, gets uploaded. Um, but we have 11.6 billion of international climate finance. That's all official development assistance. That's all aid, uh, aid spend uh, across, um, across the world for developing countries um, out to March 2026. That's when the current uh, sort of spending review periods uh, end. And as part of that 11.6 billion, we have some ring fences. So one of the ring fences is going to talk about that's most relevant to hydrogen uh, is our what we call our Ayrton Fund commitment, which is one billion pounds for clean energy innovation uh, in developing countries. But we also have ring fences on uh, on nature uh, and adaptation uh, finance. And we're trying to link a lot of this climate finance as well into some of these big initiatives that we're seeing in, in hydrogen as well. So you may have followed the breakthrough agenda that was launched at COP26. And there's various uh, breakthroughs under that. Um, the most recent one that's going to come out this year is the Buildings Mission. But the hydrogen one was one of the first that was out there. Um, but then there's also those that are linked to it. So the, the industry ones like uh, steel and cement, also there's an important role for hydrogen within those. So there's, a, so there's an interrelation between the different breakthrough um, uh, as well. Mission Innovation has been going since I think it's 2015, if I can remember correctly, and someone can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong on that. And the second phase of Mission Innovation is currently uh, taking place. Uh, and then the second phase has a clean hydrogen mission. So we're looking at how, how we can use uh, that as well. In terms of this commitment that I mentioned, there's one billion pound uh, clean energy innovation commitment. Um, so this is, uh, as I said, out to sort of March 2026, and we're developing the programs at the moment. Um, some of them uh, are delivered through multilaterals like the Asian Development Bank. So we have a, a very big active portfolio with the ADB. We also have a big active portfolio with the World Bank as well. Um, so the World Bank, for example, has got uh, developed a new green hydrogen window as part of its energy sector management assistance program. Um, we're a big donor to the industrial development, uh, sorry, industrial decarbonisation uh, window as well, which has had quite a few projects on hydrogen. And I'm going to give one case study at the end of my presentation uh, to show how we go from this high level commitment down to the um, specific project uh, on the ground as well. Um, the key things, I think, with this, this commitment is we're trying to look at how do you accelerate a lot of clean tech? So how do you accelerate the commercialization of new technologies? So in this case, what are the new innovations in hydrogen for clean hydrogen? across different sectors, transport, industry, power sector, the whole range that this will focus on. Uh, so one slide to try and cover the whole commitment. Um, there's a series of uh, programs in the green boxes that you see there. Some of them are operational now and available uh, for projects to, to fund projects. Others have been set up. So one of the new ones and exciting ones we're looking at is how you can use uh, climate pool financing. So I haven't seen really many examples of, of this in, in hydrogen. If anyone has had experience with this, uh, it'd be great to chat afterwards. So this is the role of things like advanced market commitments for clean hydrogen, results-based financing approaches, which are quite common in say nature um, and biodiversity financing in carbon markets or green public procurement, which we've seen more in energy efficiency and, and things like that. Patent buyouts, all these types of pool mechanisms. So if anyone's done some, uh, in that space, it'd be really great to, to chat. So talking about the, the bigger scale, not the small scale prizes, the, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars per project type of uh, scale is what uh, we want to look at. And to give you a few examples, and I think it's gone just off the bottom of the slide there, so I'm not sure what's happened there, um, but you can see at least the first three programs um, that are just some examples of where we've been supporting uh, hydrogen or where we support the hydrogen through themes like industrial decarbonization. Uh, so the first one up there includes 
um, almost a 20 million pound program on industrial decarbonisation through the World Bank, and I'll show some hydrogen projects within that. Um, we have a new uh, program that I've got a slide on, which I'm quite excited about, which is our first sort of dedicated climate finance uh, program and pillar on clean hydrogen. Um, it's also got uh, work on critical minerals as well, which is a, another big topic that we're focusing on. And then we've done some more smaller scale sort of research and development capacity building through the Climate Compatible Growth Program. Each of these programs has uh, an annual review and a, and a website. Um, so can put you in touch with uh, the relevant leads if you're interested to know more about uh, these programs. Um, so just to take a case study, so I've gone from the high level and now going to the mid level to take one of these programs. Um, and I want to just go through very briefly uh, some of the work that they've done. So, for example, in this clean energy innovation facility, um, it's brought about 87 projects so far over the last few years. Um, obviously, there was a bit of a slow down with COVID, but actually, um, we did see quite a lot of resilience um, in a lot of our uh, programs, on, especially on the heavy industry side, that actually did continue um, over the last few years, um, which is good to see. We've also got other themes like AI and digitalization. So if anyone came to the digitalization um, presentation a few uh, days ago, um, spoke a bit more about that one. Uh, the sustainable cooling and energy storage um, as well. So to give you one very specific project that we've done very recently, and that actually will come out in August, uh, the final report. So we do a range of types of projects. So with this innovation funding, most of it will go towards pilots. So we actually wanna see the pilots um, on the ground, but we also will do analytical work. So it's very country dependent in terms of what the needs are. And in some countries, it might be there's a really specific analytical need that's needed or capacity building for innovators working on hydrogen in that country, for example. Um, in this case, it was, it was more of a regional study um, that looked at eight countries, including India and Pakistan, um, for how to um, try to look at the investment opportunities for clean hydrogen uh, as well. Now, this is just one of, um, I think in that, that fund, we've done about 22 projects, I think. Um, that have looked at this. So if anyone's interested in other types of projects, like the pilots, um, obviously for things like industry, they are huge sites. So this has taken a small part of that, might be one bit of tech on a broader, uh, say, steel plant. In this case, it was a, an analytical study. So about $2 million, that's probably the average size of the projects that we support um, in the region. And I think this might be my last slide. So Steve, you might get some time back. <laughs> you might get a whole minute and a half back. Um, so my final slide is on what I am very excited about this program, the Accelerate to Demonstrate um, program. It's a very new one. We've got our first dedicated aid um, pillar on, on hydrogen. So as I said before, a lot of our work was through other programs, through other themes. But here we're dedicated to clean hydrogen. And we have another pillar on critical minerals and a cross-cutting pillar. Um, it's delivered through the UN's Industrial Development Organization. They've really sort of built in a big um, hydrogen part of their organization and working closely with the World Bank's uh, Green Hydrogen Window and also some of the, the earlier work that the ADB's uh, doing as well in this space. Um, so this was announced at COP27, but only really launched last month. Um, it probably won't be ready to support projects till early 2024 because it's all in the setup phase, but if anyone's obviously interested in this, then yeah, feel free to, to talk to me and my team and we can uh, put you in the right uh, place. I think that might be the last slide. So hopefully that, that was uh, interesting and sets the scene between the two sessions and a minute and 15 seconds back for you. Thank you. So now I leave the floor to Mats that uh, will uh, introduce us a bit more about uh, what's, the, what's the future like for uh, Asia and hydrogen. Thank you. But um, can I get a clicker or oh, that's it. Wrong presentation, right. <laughs> Give us a second. Right. Before, before we start, then I'd like to thank everyone. Like Emmanuel, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to set the scene here. Also, thanks very much for everyone else for joining us here today um, in this late session on one of the last days of the convention. So very happy that everyone's still here. Um, first of all, a tiny bit about myself. My name is Matt Stolne. I'm the team lead for the energy markets and strategy team for DNV in the Asia Pacific region based out of Singapore. Um, and for those that are not familiar with DNV, we are an independent technical advisor um, with strong background in the maritime sector, uh, energy space, as well as in uh, business assurance. 
Um, I think a lot has already been said uh, in the earlier session today about the future role of hydrogen. So I'll not go into too much detail here and kind of iterate that I fully agree with a lot of statements from, from the earlier session. Um, and then to summarize, I think hydrogen is going to be playing an important role in the decarbonization of future energy transition. However, it is not the silver bullet. It's not the only solution. And therefore we have to consider where really does hydrogen play a role and focus our limited resources, our limited time and our limited money on really where hydrogen really matters. Um, so DNV every year produces an energy transition outlook. Um, this energy transition outlook is basically our best guess, our estimation of what the most likely future will be, the development of energy demand, energy supply all the way to 2050. Um, as part of this, this uh, suite, we have last year for the first time uh, released a separate uh, dedicated hydrogen report looking at the role of hydrogen specifically towards 2050, and more recently a report looking at the future of transport, so transport in transition, and the role of, for example, biofuels and sustainable aviation fuel um, in decarbonizing the sector alongside electrification. Um, when it comes to hydrogen, I think it's very important to realize that there are a number of sectors where hydrogen will really play an important role, and those are the hard to abate sectors. As we already mentioned earlier today, um, electricity is re required to make hydrogen, so where you can use electricity, there is no point in using hydrogen. So where do we use hydrogen? We use hydrogen where electrification is either technically not an option or not commercially viable. So a number of these applications are listed here. So the first one is really decarbonizing existing uses of hydrogen. Of course, if you have hydrogen already, you need it as a chemical feedstock or its chemical properties, for example, in the refinery sector, you cannot replace it with electricity. So therefore really hydrogen there is your only option for decarbonization. Um, the second one is, is fuel switching. Um, so there's a number of applications where um, we use existing fossil fuels, but potentially we see that uh, in the future, those fossil fuels need to be decarbonized and electricity is not an option. A typical example here is high temperature heat in industry. Or see when uh, the industrial uh, demand is for very low temperatures, you can very easily electrify it. It's very efficient, very cheap. But once you go to too high temperatures and very, very specialized processes, that you can no longer electrify it. It might sometimes be technically possible, but it might not be economically viable. So here we really see that hydrogen will play a potential role as replacing, for example, natural gas in industry. Um, the last one is a very important one as well. It's really the new uses of hydrogen, where we see that there's an existing fuel being used um, that is not, uh, does not match with our long-term visions of full decarbonization, and where really we need to have new fuels and new infrastructure. Um, examples of these are especially the maritime sector, where you might have, uh, for short term, short distances, you might use electricity. For medium distance, maybe liquid hydrogen is already an option, but especially for deep sea shipping, you really need a new alternative, a new low carbon fuel, such as ammonia or methanol. Uh, another one will be in the aviation sector, where um, you cannot electrify planes for too long of a distance because of the weight and the limited energy density. So here, sustainable aviation fuels really are the future. So the new use of hydrogen also going to play a very key role. Um, when it comes to our forecast of the energy use, we see that um, the, energy, uh, the, the energy demand for hydrogen is going to um, increase slowly over the next 10 years. And we see that towards 2030, there's going to be very limited applications of uh, green hydrogen, especially um, in different industries. Uh, the reason for this is simply the fact that hydrogen is very expensive right now and it's not abundantly available. Large scale projects have not really been developed and won't really come online until the end of the decade. From 2030 onward, we really see that a lot of uh, demand growth will come in, in for hydrogen. A lot of this demand growth will come from new applications of hydrogen. So we've had a lot of talk already this morning, uh, this afternoon. And for example, in, in steel making, we see it in cement industry, we see it in uh, the transportation sector, aviation, uh, maritime. And um, so a lot of these new applications are really going to drive the hydrogen demand. Um, what we especially see is that by 2040, um, the relative share of energy uses of hydrogen becomes bigger than the, um, the, the regular uses of hydrogen. So hydrogen can either be used as a feedstock, for example, in making ammonia, in making uh, um, in, in, in the refinery sector, uh, but from 2040 onward, really the fuel uses, so hydrogen for use in maritime sector, in use of industry and power generation, are going to overtake the use of hydrogen as a feedstock. And um, towards 2050, we see that this demand growth will continue to increase uh, and hydrogen will top out about 5% of the, the total energy demand by 2050. Um, while this sounds like a lot, this is actually not enough right now to make our climate targets. So we believe that in order to be able to make a 1.5 degree targets, we actually need about 15% hydrogen 
in our energy mix by 2050. That means that we really need to start accelerating and there's a lot more that we still have to do. Um, Asia will be among the key regions leading the charge in terms of hydrogen production development, um, especially from China and from, from India. Um, what we really see here is that in 2030, most of the hydrogen produced will still be from fossil fuels, while after 2040, 2050, a lot more will shift towards greener forms of hydrogen, uh, with uh, greener hydrogen making up about 85% uh, of the total uh, production in uh, 2050. Um, what you can also see is that Southeast Asia, which is at the bottom of the line here, um, is kind of lagging behind, both in terms of the total amount of hydrogen produced by, by 2050, uh, but also the share of renewables where it will still depend more than 50% on fossil fuel origin hydrogen by 2050. Um, one of the reasons for this is the lack of policy support. So policy is a very important driver, as we've heard in other sessions before, in getting this hydrogen and getting this hydrogen transition off the ground. And Southeast Asia still is lagging a bit behind in some of the other regions here. Um, luckily, there's a lot of positive news. There's also a lot of energy and a lot of attention being paid, put into hydrogen in the Southeast Asia region in the last few years. And this started to culminate in much more, for example, strategies being developed um, on a national scale. Um, one example of this is the strategy we did together with GIZ for, for Thailand, where we developed a roadmap looking at exactly the role of hydrogen um, within that country in decarbonizing um, by 2050. Um, we followed a very similar approach to some of the other, uh, other approaches that have been discussed this morning, really looking at where does hydrogen make a difference. Um, here we really differentiate between where do we see that hydrogen is your only road to decarbonization, which means it's a guaranteed demand for hydrogen. Where do we see that hydrogen is in competition with other resources? Um, in this analysis, we already took out all of the competition with electrification. So the competition here you're focusing on is especially biomass, biofuel, and biogas. Uh, and where do we see that hydrogen should really not play any major role? Um, what can be noted here is that for power generation and transport, the picture is relatively clear. Um, you, for power generation, you want to maximize the use of renewables as much as possible, but you will also uh, want to have interconnectors as much as possible, but you will run into a limit where at some point you will need to have some form of dispatchable, flexible power generation, which you can only decarbonize with a low carbon fuel, which in the future will likely be hydrogen or ammonia. Um, in transport, we see that in road transport, typically you want to electrify everything that you can. The only potential application you have for hydrogen um, is for really long distance trucking, where very heavy, very longer distances, where batteries might be less suitable. But even there, we see the market generally moving towards electrification uh, rather than using hydrogen. Uh, maritime and aviation sector, as just discussed, there is no real alternative for hydrogen. Um, when it comes to industry, um, low temperature heat, as we discussed previously, should be electrified. High temperature, there's a lot of competitions, very interesting, and you really have to look at individual subsectors to see what the best alternative is. The general consensus here is that if you have an installation, for example, that currently uses coal, you don't want to reinvest and make a hydrogen burner. You want to continue to use your existing infrastructure. So you would like to use, for example, biomass, which doesn't require much uh, adjustment. Uh, the same would go for oil, where a transition towards biofuel is quite natural. Um, however, biomass, biofuel, and biogas, they have some limitations, which actually comes in terms of the scale. So they are very useful for small-scale applications, especially decentralized, uh, but for large-scale applications, it becomes a lot more difficult to use these installations. Uh, and therefore, at that point, it becomes much more logical to switch towards hydrogen. So you really also have to consider like the local availability of resources and how that would affect the options every country has to decarbonize each of its sectors and really target where hydrogen plays a key role. Um, of course, as mentioned before, the economics are incredibly important um, and really compare that on a fuel by fuel basis across these different sectors. Um, and can be noted with no policy support, uh, cost parity with oil is relatively easy to reach um, already quite soon, but especially when it comes to deep replacing natural gas and especially coal, it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, you can, of course, do this via subsidies or you can do this via taxation. Um, but because governments like earning money and not spending money, we focus on taxation in this case. Uh, but it's very clear that you really need a relatively high carbon price to reach that cost parity with natural gas and with coal, even by 2050. Um, if you combine all of this, so you say, okay, we now know pretty much how much hydrogen can be used across all of these different sectors, as well as what uh, is expected in terms of the cost parity, you can kind of start to understand when will hydrogen really start playing a role in a country such as Thailand. Um, what can be noted here is, is on one hand, uh, the fact that the transport sector currently has a massive market potential, but the idea is that, of course, a lot of this will be electrified over time, 
So it's better not to focus too much too early on, on, on uh, the transport sector and really wait until um, the uh, kind of look at focus on the part that will not be electrified towards 2050. Uh, the real potential will really lie in the industry and power generation sectors, but also here, of course, cost will be a very important driver. Uh, so policy is really necessary to support this to make sure that we can actually introduce hydrogen by 2050 and ensure that we make this energy transition possible. Uh, and lastly, because we're out of time, uh, very briefly, uh, because of course, of course, cost is very important, but it's not the only thing. For every government that's planning to introduce hydrogen on a national scale, there's a lot of different things that they will have to consider, um, some of which are listed here, such as the financial support, safety aspects of hydrogen, standards certification, making sure that hydrogen can be classified as low carbon, giving certainty to off-takers and, um, and uh, suppliers both, as well as, of course, a very important facilitating role in ensuring that the infrastructure is available to connect suppliers and, and users. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Great, great presentation. Thank you. You want to sit already? Uh, now it's time for our panel. Uh, so I will ask our distinguished panelists uh, to join me in the, on the stage and uh, sit here. We have uh, quite a nice group of uh, experts uh, today with us, uh, and they are all uh, already working uh, in the space of green hydrogen. I think I can switch to this. Okay. No need for this presentation. Thank you. Maybe with the... Okay. Thank you. And... Um... Okay. So I will ask you if you care to introduce yourself and explain how you are, what's your role in this hydrogen sector, or how do you expect it to be, to grow, and whatever you want to add on this topic. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nishant Balashanmugam. I'm the India representative for the Green Hydrogen Organization. And uh, thanks to Stevens and Emmanuel for putting this together. And it gives me great pride to come represent the Green Hydrogen Organization here. We are a multi-stakeholder foundation with one mission that is to accelerate the adoption of green hydrogen. And of course, the previous session, um, you know, they gave us a reality check on green hydrogen and how much do we really need it. But all I can tell you is that it will help, you know, um, abate at least 20% of the world's carbon emissions. So there is a necessity for it, and it is, it is the only solution for us to reach the 1.5 degree pathway that we set forth. So as the Green Hydrogen Organization, we work with industry, civil society, the DFIs, and also academia. So we support governments on policies, market enablement. We work with industry on standards and certifications in the space. And we work with uh, several research bodies and institutions to bring um, green green hydrogen technologies that are nascent uh, out to the market. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manuel, and of course, Stephen for organizing this again. Um, I'm um, the, currently, the, as, as the designation states here, work with the Ministry of Science and Energy Innovation, um, where we, looking, we are looking at uh, future technologies, advanced technologies to uh, to help the country prepare ourselves to becoming a national uh, a nation that uh, that uh, driven by high technology uh, to spearhead our socioeconomic development. And uh, one of the focus areas is of course on energy consumption and other industrial applications of uh, of science and innovation. Uh, and in regards to hydrogen um, specific sector, they were looking at uh, we um, the ministry developed several roadmaps, uh, including this uh, hydrogen roadmap that we are going to be able to hopefully launch by the end of the month as well. I mean, just now Singapore, I mean, Indonesia uh, may be also doing that the same. We've, we've, uh, worked, we've worked on this uh, hydrogen roadmap for the past uh, two years, actually, and we've uh, finalized it. Uh, um, and essentially, it will hopefully bring um, some um, potential for partnerships, uh, including for trade international. Uh, of course, we are looking at decarbonization supporting our decarbonization efforts by 2050, where the country has this target of uh, uh, net zero by 2050. Um, and um, these roadmaps was, um, was developed um, uh, across uh, sectoral um, organizations, including international organizations from Japan, Korea, and other parts of the world, uh, even Singapore, where we, where we look at um, the, the dynamics of, of the supply chain. 
and we hope to be able to bring this uh, to uh, to SLE as uh, 2030 to 2050. Well, I'll have some 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 more uh, to describe after this. But in essence, uh, what the ministry is doing is de developing uh, and charting future uh, true north uh, roadmaps that will be focusing on several sectoral uh, vertical technologies that that are uh, having a, you know, what do you call that um, um, the strength uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 the ability to do uh, the changes. Thank you. Same. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Serene Chua, and I'm from the External Relations Department of the Singapore's Energy Market Authority. So um, for us, we're actually looking to the organization um, of the Singapore International Energy Week, which will be happening um, on the 23rd to the 27th of October this year, um, with a focus on the theme of energy transition towards a net zero world. I warmly invite everyone to join us in Singapore this year. I mean, I'm honored to be invited to be part of the panel to share on Singapore's energy transition. So to share a little bit briefly, Singapore is harnessing the four switches of natural gas, solar, regional power grids, as well as low carbon alternatives to transform its energy supply. So when we talk about natural gas, 95% um, of Singapore's power generation actually comes from natural gas, which is the cleanest form of fossil fuel. As we accelerate our efforts to shift towards cleaner energy sources, we will still need to rely on stable sources such as natural gas during this transition. This is really to ensure um, supply reliable, energy reliability in powering our home as well as the economy. Solar remains as Singapore's most promising source of renewable energy, and Singapore has been ramping up our domestic renewable energy generation capacity through the installation of solar PVs. Aside from expanding deployment, um, we have also been developing innovative technologies as well as implementing supportive policies to encourage renewable energy adoption. Um, this is to achieve our target of harnessing 2 gigawatt peak of solar by 2030. Um, the third spoke, which will be on electricity imports, which is um, to encourage international collaborations and cooperations as they create opportunities for countries um, with abundant renewable energy sources to export their clean energy surplus to regions that require additional clean energy sources. Um, I mean, in addition, increased regional interconnectivity can also accelerate renewable energy development in the region, facilitate economic growth, as well as enhance energy security by uh, diversifying energy sources. So the last part to it will actually be the low carbon technologies. We are also exploring the feasibility of other low carbon technologies, such as geothermal carbon capture, utilization and storage in achieving our net zero goal. So to add on, last year, our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Mr. Lawrence Wong, outlined Singapore's national strategy to develop hydrogen as a major decarbonization pathway to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. For Singapore, hydrogen will complement and diversify our power mix along solar, imported electricity and other potential low carbon energy sources. Depending on technological developments and the development of other energy sources, hydrogen could supply up to half of our power needs by 2050 and will play an important role in decarbonizing our industry. Singapore has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050 as part of our contribution to global climate action. As a small and densely populated city state, Singapore faces significant limitations in harnessing alternative energies with limited land for solar deployment and no access to wind and hydropower at a meaningful scale. We will nevertheless make an ambitious effort to lower our carbon footprint and develop more sustainably. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Song. Hello, uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jadyong Song from Korea. I'm a director of National uh, Institute of Green Technology. I'm working for the Ministry of uh, Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea. And then um, NIGT, um, I wanna, uh, firstly, I will uh, introduce my organization. In Korea in 2012, uh, we, our national agenda was uh, Green Growth. That's why um, NIGT was established by uh, presidential office over ROK, Korea. And then we, just two years ago, we established the GGGI as you know, Green Growth uh, a Global Green Growth Institute, and then we hosting the GCF to Korea for uh, like a Green Triangle technology policy and fund. That's the Korean government's uh, uh, aim to the uh, global green growth for developing country. So 
the further uh, hydrogen technology. So in Korea, so we our you know technology you know governance is quite unique uh, bit, uh, compared with the uh, USA and or so many countries. Um, we are thirty percent, thirty three percent for uh, university R and D, and then thirty three percent for industry, and also the other you know thirty uh, three percent for public R and D. It means uh, the leading of the uh, uh, hydrogen technology also. So we divide three you know, uh, 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 um, parts or areas for university, industry, uh, public R&D. So you know, NIGT is um, you know, a policy you know, uh, institute of green technology. It means it's a very important thing is the R&D policy and national plan or a framework for hydrogen. So even those, you know, they are the very important things to the trade of the hydrogen technology or hydrogen market. But before it, so we should think about the hydrogen technology in a, a development for developing country or so. There's only think about the, the its market. So uh, first of all. So we need uh, you know, uh, think of the loom for like uh, development of developing country of the uh, hydrogen technology in R&D. So Korean government so, you know, so we, um, is highlighting the hydrogen economy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Also, we made two acts. First one is uh, uh, Climate Technology Act. Uh, by Ministry of Science and ICT. Secondly, uh, Hydrogen Act by Ministry of Industry. There's a two uh, key players for hydrogen technology. You know, one of them is the Science Ministry, uh, uh, I, uh, ICT. Also, the other hand is Ministry of Industry. It means in Korea, R&D is a, a most important thing for uh, close to that business sector. That's why, you know, the the is there some you know, supervising you know, entity for under the uh, presidential office of uh, Korea? It means uh, the driving of R&D is very important because why, as you know, in a, um, a hydrogen uh, pipeline in Europe, they, they can uh, connect, but in Korea is like an island it's because of North Korea. So we don't have <laughs> making in a uh, pipeline. That's why we use the port and then so, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna say it later, so for the International Cooperation for Hydrogen Again Technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, um, the hydrogen policies, the hydrogen strategies uh, in Southeast Asia in particular are pretty late to come. They are, we, have, we still have a lot of questions. So let me ask you, Dr. Atanam, the first question. We just heard that uh, they, uh, Hydrogen, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen strategy of Malaysia will be published soon. And from some early uh, information, we understand that uh, Malaysia wants to become an hydrogen exporter, in particular the region of uh, Sarawak. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Uh, can you give us uh, some more information? Can you elaborate on this, uh, in particular also on the feedstock that you want to produce, blue, green, etc.? Yeah, okay, see, the um, the approach of this so soon to be uh, announced and published uh, a hydrogen technology and economy roadmap um, is to mainly focus on uh, domestic and some uh, demand as we move forward towards uh, decarbonization as well as net zero achievements. Um, so we're focusing on, of course, the main sectors, power, transportation, industry, and, uh, and other uh, potential users, but those are the main ones. Uh, but when we talk about transitioning, um, it's, it's, it cannot be just focusing directly immediately on green hydrogen. We have to have still get this uh, transition right. And based on our you know, economic analysis uh, we, uh, for the next 30 years, it's going to be the short term 2030, 2040, 2050 kind of time horizon. We're looking at um, um, introducing, uh, of course, doing uh, whatever we, uh, we're doing right now already. So we're producing uh, slightly less of around one uh, MTPA million million tons of per annum of hydrogen right now, but mainly grey hydrogen. Um, so the, the region that you're saying um, green hydrogen um, that that uh, that has already started doing in bright in, since 2019, if I'm mistaken, which is in Sarawak, as part of uh, east of Malaysia, um, that 
the, the main uh, source of energy is hydro. So they, they have that potential. And as such, uh, the demonstration plant that is now producing uh, rough, roughly around 130 kilograms per day uh, is already in, in, in action in demonstration stage. Uh, there are several, um, what you call that, vehicles, buses, uh, a few cars that are already uh, operating on it. Of course, the popular Toyota, I mean, Toyota and the popular Hyundai, and I'm not going to say the brand name, the model of the car, but it's already there. Um, so when you talk about, when we, we look at the, the, the dynamic, dynamics of, uh, of supply and also the raw materials that we have, of course we have solar, but we cannot, I mean, there's, there's challenges in land and, 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 and such. We also have biomass, uh, biogas from, from our palm oil mill effluent, for example, that can potentially be, of course, hydropower and um, uh, for, for potential use of hydrogen, uh, gray, gray hydrogen production. Um, so being an exporter is not something that we strive for um, because anyway, in ammonia, uh, the ammonia that, that Petronas, the, uh, the petroleum company, uh, national company, is already uh, exporting to, to, to Japan and, and, and the likes. Um, we are, uh, that's, that kind of uh, exports are, are mainly, um, as of now, already started. But in, in uh, the, the, the roadmap that we have developed, the economic analysis shows that by 2050, uh, if we, there's two scenarios essentially. We are not going to be, if there is this business as usual scenario and there's this emission driven scenario. Uh, by 2050, the business as usual shows that uh, about 7 million tons of pen pen per annum can be produced if we do not use any interventions like uh, technological interventions, even taxes and whatnot. But if you introduce a more aggressive one, then we'll be able to produce until 2050, the kinds of around 16, 15 million tons per, per annum, uh, but mainly uh, 50 over percent, 40 over percent, 40, 40, 40, 40, 45, 55 kind of green versus blue. So it's not gonna be mainly green, although we have the abundant solar and whatnot, but that's how we're looking at it as we move transitioning from, from, uh, from the likes of, and again, it's not even even in, in, in transportation sector. The roadmap that, that the strategy that we're focusing on is as at most uh, between 15 20 percent of total industry volume. So it's not going to be. Um, I mean, I think it's similar to, but maybe better than Thailand, the one that the NGO is showing just now. That that shows Thailand is not going to be able to do it in in, in mobility, uh, but we we may be able to to do a bit more uh, as such. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now a question for Dr. Song. Uh, um, I know that you are a very proponent for collaboration, international collaboration, and Korea wants to import hydrogen. So cooperation between your country and the countries in the region is important. So I may ask you, how do you, do you and Korea envision uh, international cooperation in the context of the hydrogen strategy? What are the benefits for their countries? Well, um, it's a complicated question for because, as I mentioned before, it's Korea in you know, um, uh, hydrogen technology is quite beginning, but all countries are beginning, but um, especially, you know, we just focus on, you know, in Korea is, and you know, Japan and USA, uh, no, Germany. So we are in you know, a strong manufacturing country. So in the, in, in the, and then uh, heavy industry, it means that we use the, you know, uh, fossil, you know, fuel, and then the industry. So, the the president Yoon Song Yeo, the 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 of uh, Korea, he mentioned about the G7 summit and proposed the building a hydrogen cooperation platform for the G7 countries. Because why Korea Korea is a strong, you know, import country, uh, the hydrogen. So, we. Uh, we need uh, in a cooperation with um, you know developing country also there is the resources they can make it for us for like uh, renewable energy and the wars uh, wind power insights there then we can you know uh, uh, we have the technology for like uh, example high efficiency water electrolysis technology so we can put it then then so we can you know get to the Korea. That's why it's a very important markets you know in the developing country, developing countries. And then the the distance is very important in the Asian country. Also, is a good potential for R and D because uh, they can make it you know. And then that, that's a two days ago uh, with the Danish government, uh, we uh, jo we got the agreements, uh, Minister Rebel, and then for. Uh, R&D cooperation with the Danish uh, um, uh, 
uh, University DTU for hydrogen technology in a cooperation, especially you know Danish Denmark they are very strong for wind power and then the green hydrogen is uh, like a domain. And then Korea, as I mentioned, so we are in a fuel cell in a mobility and then so we can put in that this joint research. So that's why you know and then we can get some you know um, lesson from the Germany because. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we are in Ireland, that, but uh, from the some ports, we need to uh, you know, carry on to the soul. That's why we need a pipeline for hydrogen you know, carrying. Then also, you know, the, the R&D cooperation is very important for the industry. That's why Hanoi and uh, SK, they are uh, good and then uh, they are finding some opportunity with uh, a public R&D cooperation. That's why the, the companies does put in the R&D and then a hydrogen ecosystem. And then also Hyundai, uh, Hyundai, Hyundai, yeah. They are uh, the focus on the utilizing of the uh, hydrogen R&D from the public sector. That's why we are co-working there. So then we can collaborate in the public sector also uh, 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 private sector in Korea. So yeah, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I have a question for Ms. Chua because um... I've read the Singaporean strategy and it's a very peculiar one. Uh, it contains uh, inform interesting information. For example, uh, the desire to use uh, natural gas for decades that, as you mentioned, is the cleanest fossil fuel, but it's still a fossil fuel. And also there's the mentioning that uh, the current measures for, from Singapore are not enough uh, to fully decarbonize uh, the, 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 the island, the, the, the country. So uh, it, you will need to import a part of your energy. And uh, again, I have basically the same questions uh, that I had before, what uh, kind of uh, international cooperation you are looking for uh, and uh, what, how it can uh, help you to uh, resolve your constraints. So um, we believe that the energy transition is a collective regional and global effort. Um, it requires us to really harness collective strengths and efforts that transcends borders. Um, alongside innovation and technology, um, which are increasingly important for the world to achieve a successful energy transition, um, I think we also need to step up collaborations on all our front. So um, I believe many countries and companies in Asia are making substantial investments in decarbonization. So on our end, electricity imports is actually one of the key switch that we are uh, that we have sort of adopted to um, for the energy transition. Um, so maybe to share a little bit, um, we have what we call the Laos PDR Thailand Malaysia Singapore Power Integration Project, which commenced in June 2022. Um, last year, representing the first multilateral cross-border electricity trade involving four ASEAN countries, as well as the first renewable energy imports into Singapore. So I think in March this year, um, we also granted the first conditional approval for electricity imports to um, bring in one gigawatt of electricity from Cambodia into Singapore. This really marks significant milestone in meeting our um, imports target. So I think the other aspect to it is in terms of the low carbon technology. So like we've mentioned, um, we have developed the four switches, which will then help us. So it's not like um, we are just waiting to see what happens, but we're also making active efforts. So we actually awarded 55 million to 12 research projects um, focused on improving the te technical and economical feasibility of things such as hydrogen, CCUS, um, to help accelerate deployment in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. And to conclude the part on policies, I have another question for Dr. Hazman. Um, so to what extent uh, the existence of other strategies like the Korean one, the Japanese one, uh, or the Singaporean one uh, that all wants to import hydrogen impacted uh, your uh, strategy, your policy making? Um, yeah, I mean, we have, um, I think, of a really good grounds of, of integration partnerships through this B2B, for example. So um, although there could be some contractual, so to speak, in the future, contractual agreement to supply and, and export um, and the requirement for them to also uh, be partnering, like, like what our colleague Singapore is saying, as international uh, collaboration, we have to do it together. Um, that, that would mean that um, as we try to balance between, as a, a nation trying to balance our, our targets, uh, to also decarbonize. Uh, hence, we have, uh, uh, so to speak, in the strategy, we'll we have identified, we'll be announcing uh, uh, that, that it's going to be um, 
somewhat uh, build some and buy some uh, where we'll be uh, focusing on technologies that can actually lower the cost quickly. We'll buy the technology that, that will help us to actually uh, be a, a player in supply chain export, and exporting. But in essence, towards uh, 2050 in the, in the roadmap, we're just looking at uh, between uh, 10 to 15% of what we're going to produce uh, in the technology economy analysis for export market. So essentially, the majority of it, 80 to 90 percent, will still be uh, targeting for for domestic consumption. But in any case, uh, when you talk about uh, trade, uh, we are also looking at investment and also revenue generation that from that investments. Um, the investment value can could reach as high as um, uh, in, tri in trillion ringgit or 1.3 trillion something like that uh, for for revenue uh, of of 20 billion uh, SLE as 20 uh, SLE as uh, uh, 2030 of around 12.1 billion ringgit uh, of revenue, but that that's that's uh, that that is how we look at revenue generation from industry uh, industry that we're going to be that are going to focus on on on, on technologies and also products to uh, fertilize the market and whatnot, uh, and also to support uh, our uh, trade partners. Uh, so in in that balancing act, uh, the roadmap will uh, has already uh, identified. Uh, the uh, the way that we'll be doing doing building some and buying some, uh, as we have although we have a lot of uh, raw materials, but there are also challenges in terms of extracting raw materials. Let's like, take for example storage facility. If you not if you spot ammonia, um, then you have to have uh, specialized vessels in it. So that, that vessels will have to partner with so to speak importing countries. If we don't, I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure whether they're going to be able to just focus on specializing in vessel development or building new ones, uh, but that is how we're going to uh, also approach uh, this uh, as we move forward uh, uh, into these uh, uh, new potentials. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now to move uh, to India. Uh, India has some interesting targets uh, to have uh, a lot, to become a superpower of green hydrogen, possibly without even uh, much of trading. But at the same time, they want to achieve 450 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity uh, by 2030. So I was I wanted to ask you what's your opinion about uh, uh, what are the synergies between uh, green hydrogen and uh, other renewable energies and the renewable energy sources sorry, of the Indian context? Uh, and do you believe uh, that in the Indian context, rules like uh, the EU additionalities are needed? Thank you for that question, Emmanuel. <clears throat> I think India has this need to be for its own energy security, and it gives it the added advantage of improving its current physical account deficit. So we've been um, a big oil importer. In fact, for uh, the fertilizer industry, India imports nearly 16 to 20% of the world's uh, ammonia derivatives for the fertilizer industry. And I think one of our colleagues earlier mentioned that we are the third largest importer of uh, you know, all of these fossil fuels and hydrogen derivatives. So for India, this is mission critical. And since 2021, there has been a huge drive not just from the government, but also from private and industry. So India is moving at a rapid pace. They're looking to adopt this. There are so many uh, smaller companies, technologies that you don't hear of, right? They are sitting in the institutions and as the Green Hydrogen Organization, we are looking to give them a platform to come up. Going to your uh, question about India's 450 gigawatt of uh, RE installations by 2030, I don't want to be pessimistic, neither do I want to be, you know, too optimistic. I'll give you facts. I think in 2021, we install, uh, 2022, sorry, we install about 16 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy. And that brings us, you know, closer to 130 to 140 gigawatt of install capacity. So we're looking to go from there to uh, 450 by 2030. So we need to go at a pace of about 46 to 47 gigawatts a year. And we are at 16 gigawatts. But India gets things done. I know if you ask us to come at five o'clock, people will show up at 5.30 because we have different reference points culturally as well. So 450 gigawatt was actually planning for 300 maybe. So you never know. Now, this, this is how we like to joke about this because we are not fully equipped for this transition. Most of the state-owned power operators and distributors in India are bankrupt. They have no money. And to improve the grid and, you know, to bring all of these um, 
round the clock supply for green hydrogen. They're all challenges, but um, as a country, we've always pulled through. So we believe that a strong collaboration between international and national partnerships will uh, see us get closer to the target, if not the target. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, the topic of collaboration and cooperation is coming uh, multiple times today. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, governments may have some difficulties to uh, support uh, renewable energy. And I know that your organization also produced a, a very insightful report about blended finance uh, and the role of private sector in uh, uh, for green hydrogen. So, um, yeah, the question is, uh, how do you believe, uh, what, what's the role of blended finance in this case for green hydrogen? Uh, should we expect uh, this uh, source of financing coming up now or maybe later in the future? And uh, how can it be used effectively in, in the context of India, if you can, about Asia too? I mean, this, uh, this also makes me wonder how many people in the audience are from the finance sector. If I could have a show of hands. Okay. Thank you. I'm no expert. So, you know, I'll try and uh, keep this for everyone else. So, of course, blended finance is a big uh, need for something like green hydrogen. And for those of you who don't know, it's just, uh, you know, it's bringing together different subsidies, grants from public governments, private players, and also looking at concessionary financing. You know, this helps mitigate risk in some of these projects. So the Green Hydrogen Organization, last year, we put forth a paper um, on blended finance. It's uh, there on our website. And I think we had an extended and deeper version of this in the knockshot message that the Minister in Mauritania delivered. And uh, it, this is this model that we developed is actually being implemented in North Africa um, to ensure that you know large scale green hydrogen projects have innovative financing mechanisms. Now, as a financier, you know some of the biggest concerns um, for financiers to fund a project is its bankability. Like, where are your long term offtake agreements? Right? What is the guarantee of performance on your electrolyzer? Some of these electrolyzers we have are. Now, they don't have five-year data or seven-year data for you to rely on and finance a project. So what can we do here? So in, by end of August or on, in September, um, the Green Hydrogen Organization, we are looking to release another paper that uh, looks at the entire ecosystem. We're also, I don't, uh, at least today, I didn't hear anybody talk about electrolyzer leasing. So if there is uh, a common area or you know in a cluster or a hub where you could have one gigawatt or you know gigawatt scale electrolyzers and let companies lease it out it will bring down their capital costs right now further going down if you look at uh, long-term agreements so what we could do is we can have we can facilitate long-term agreements um, collectively with you no know, governments dfis um, and some private capital where we can look at you know, contracts for difference and viability gap funding mechanisms to ensure that you know, there are long-term contracts that are available for uh, green hydrogen. So I think um, more of this will, thanks for that sign of approval, Stevens. I'm really glad. I think all the financiers really understand this because we had a very good response to this in the World Bank meeting as well. So we hope that all of these innovative mechanisms um, you know, these kind of partnerships between governments, DFIs, private capital, and also, you know, organizations like us and IRENA, you know, we could make this happen. Thank you, very optimistic. Thank you. So we discussed now about how to generate hydrogen. Uh, of course, hydrogen needs also to be consumed. Uh, and uh, I would uh, now ask Mr. Shua, another question about uh, your strategy, because uh, um, the strategy of Singapore points uh, a lot about uh, um, using hydrogen in very clear end use sectors like industry and uh, power sector. Uh, but we are only a few years away from 2050. We are only one cycle of refurbishment away before um, before 2050. So it's now time to change our, our processes. Do you believe that Singapore is ready to make that step change in its industry? So um, we believe that global developments in hydrogen are really at an inflection point at this point. Um, there's increased investments from countries and, and, and companies globally to really develop new technologies and 
establish supply chains for low carbon hydrogen. So Singapore believes that low carbon hydrogen has the potential to be a major decarbonization pathway to support our transition towards net zero by 2050. And this is taking into consideration five key trusts. So which will then look into experimenting with the use of advanced hydrogen technologies at the cups of commercial readiness through Pathfinder projects. So we aim to diversify energy sources by incorporating hydrogen into our energy mix. So, I mean, we all know that hydrogen is a clean and sustainable um, alternative to traditional fuels. So Singapore has issued an expression of interest um, for a small scale commercial project to utilize carbon, low carbon ammonia for um, power generation. So the second part to it is really how we do long-term planning for land and infrastructure. So in order for hydrogen to be viable, it requires adequate transport um, import kind of infrastructure to be put in place. So developing the necessary infrastructure to support um, such activities um, to support the production, storage and distribution of hydrogen is also important. So the third part to it is really looking into how we can um, redouble efforts in R&D to unlock key technology um, bottlenecks. So um, we are actively investing in research and development as well as to see how we can advance innovations in um, hydrogen technology. So we are looking into how we can collaborate with industry partners, you know, the academia, research institutes to really develop low cost, uh, to develop cost effective and efficient methods for hydrogen production, storage and utilization. Um, and I think Singapore is also looking at how we can explore hydrogen technologies and carrier pathways, um, which have the potential to be commercially viable, um, including ammonia, which is, I think, one of the um, agents that has been talked about quite a fair bit. Um, and I think international collaboration is also something that we would have to work very closely on, um, because we do recognize the importance of, you know, how regionally or even globally, the, reg the international collaboration is in promoting the adoption of hydrogen as a global energy solution. So um, Singapore actively engages with international partners and I think we also participate in hydrogen related initiatives um, just to really get into that opportunity to cross share knowledge. Um, and I think the last part um, is also something very important, which is how do we ensure that we have the workforce ready to help us you know, um, advance into the hydrogen technology. So it's really about supporting workforce training and the development of a broader economy. Um, so I think on this end, we look forward to working closely with the industry and international partners um, to see how we could realize um, low carbon hydrogen potential for Singapore as well as the world. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, it came across the topic of cooperation, the strong need for cooperation. So Dr. Song, uh, I know that, again that you have a very uh, strong opinion about the need to cooperate, in particular in the research sector. And hydrogen in general uh, is this sector where there are a lot of uh, announcements, boasted announcements about new technologies coming up online. But for the general public, it may be a bit difficult to recognize how mature is a technology but starting to share information, et cetera, may bring uh, a sort of, um, how to say, competition also between uh, research institutions and between the private sector that, of course, wants to be the first uh, in place, have some uh, uh, first mover advantage. So how do you see this cooperation working with the need of competition for uh, hydrogen? Well, um... For the competition in the R&D sector or business sector, we can divide. So for R&D sector, this, the, the, as you know, the, the world politics in a situation like a decoupling and then energy security. So there is a block and like uh, in uh, USA and European countries, they are strong in a good relationship. And Korea, so we are like uh, between in you know, China and um, USA, cause why? So we are good, you know, before we are good relationship with the China market or Chinese market and Chinese uh, r and in a cooperation. But now there's this quite, you know, different uh, stage of the situation in politics uh, between Korea and China. But just two weeks ago, I attended uh, some, you know, Chinese low carbon, uh, carbon neutrality forum. So in the, um, some scholars said, 
So we need uh, a collaboration, each other, cause why the for addressing uh, climate change, it's, uh, you know, uh, transboundary and trans-regional, you know, problem. Also, the hydrogen technology, it's need, it helps us for achievement of uh, our climate change, you know, and climate uh, crisis. That's why, you know, so, you know, it's very difficult for the, like, uh, you know, you know uh, profitable, you know, um, uh, things for share sharing each other but for like uh, utilizing so for example in a German case they judge uh, it they have some good you know uh, 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 example for utilizing of ODA system so it can make it something for helping or supporting them something cited for renewable energy things and then we can add it up and then like a PPP model public private you know a partnership in ODA sector in Philippines also and so making some sites with the utilizing technology, then we can trade uh, and after the, the sites, you know, add up that that's, and then, you know, in Korean case, we have, you know, some resources, you know, human resources, so because as I mentioned before, so we have public R&D governance and R&D <clears throat> system means, you know, many, you know, uh, a senior you know, engineer, uh, from the public sector, they can contribute to further, you know, hydrogen technology transfer to developing country early stage. So, so we you can, you know, find a good solution for the, you know, technology R and D also. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we pass now to the question from the from the audience. I see here two questions. One is for Mats from uh, Anas Raman. If uh, you are here, if you want to ask him. Okay. Hi, I'm Anas Rahman from International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, my question is to Mats. I saw in your slides that uh, the forecast, the sector-wise uh, demand forecast for 2050, the demand for refineries stays stagnant even until 2050. Um, does this fit well? Because the end product of refinery is definitely uh, petroleum products. Uh, does this fit well with the net zero targets which we are? Uh, targeting mm. that's, a, that's a very good question of course the, the the renewable like the targets that every different country has when it comes to decarbonization are are different um so on one hand we see that there's a lot of countries who are actively moving away from using fossil fuels um oil-based products especially in for example the transport sector moving towards electrification as of course we see that there's also still a lot of countries who are kind of in their own transition and gaining energy access and where the, the, the amount of energy demand and energy use um, is still increasing very rapidly. Even in the region here, countries like, like Vietnam are still rapidly developing in terms of how much energy demand there really is. Um, so on one hand, we definitely see that there's a move away from um, long-term from, from using oil products in the transport sector. But of course, that will not happen at the same pace in every individual country. Um, additionally, there's also, of course, a lot of things that oil is used for in terms of as a feedstock. So it's, of course, a very important um, component in making all sorts of plastics and such, um, and for which it's very difficult to move away from um, that feedstock use. Um, so we, we do believe that that over time, these kind of things even out a bit. So we see it on one hand, countries moving away from fossil fuels. On the other hand, demand overall still increasing. Um, so yeah, we think it's going to stay relatively flat um, going forward. Thank you. So we have also a question from Alan K. You want to? to... Uh, uh, just as a quick background, I, I think I did the first presentation at ACF on hydrogen and fuel cells. So that was about 11 years ago. So it's glad to see that this uh, technology is, is a very hot topic. Um, I lived in uh, Southeast Asia 22 years, and, and one of the things I realized was that the adoption of new technologies was really brilliant in this region. Uh, but I'm a little bit surprised in the technology I work in in the last 16 years. To be fair, uh, and I live in Europe now, Southeast Asia by far is the world laggard on green hydrogen, on, on green technologies such as hydrogen and fuel cells when you look at a global perspective, to be fair. And, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I try to understand that because adoption of technologies has always been wonderful in this region, but this particular technology, honestly, uh, Africa, South America, other countries or other regions are far, far ahead of Southeast Asia. And I don't quite understand why it's so far behind the rest of the world. 
So is anyone from the panel willing to take uh, this? Nice, I, I like this question. You guys get scared, I'll answer. So, so I guess someone ahead. from Southeast Asia. We have to... <laughs> um, well, I think the challenge of full cell technology is, uh, is basically infrastructure um, and, uh, uh, and also investment required to, to for support for the infrastructure. Uh, in any case, in regards to what Mr. John was saying you know, in terms of technology development, R&D, uh, the fuel cells, I mean, in the roadmap when we publish, we'll show that actually in, I mean, in the case of Malaysia, at least uh, the focus of R&D has always been in that, in that midstream, uh, what we call that delivery technology rather than others, including fuel cells. Uh, one particular good university is the National University of Malaysia is focusing on fuel cell technology, the, the, the kinds of electrolyzer, PEM and whatnot that they are doing. Uh, have, have patents, but I guess again the challenge is is uh, when we talk about how the regions are ahead in terms of commercializing it or making a full use of it out of the, in the real world, is is where the um, I mean, a part of the infrastructure maybe perhaps uh, uh, there are also other what they call the policy uh, uh, consideration when you talk about uh, potentials for using of uh, renewables and other alternative fuels uh, to, to support or to replace uh, transportation uh, consumption. Uh, well, that, I mean, that, that's, that's some initial um, feel that I have in regards to fuel cells. I'm not sure because I've not, uh, you said, maybe, maybe it's true that other regions, South Africa and, and South America ahead, but I need to, maybe there's some other factors, including policy interventions that the, country, the regions over there are better. So maybe um, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, get, we'll dive uh, deep dive deep dive in that. So, okay. I think I also want to add a point about Malaysia. There, I remember meeting a gentleman in Kuala Lumpur just two weeks ago in one of the ASEAN Green Hydrogen Conferences, and uh, this professor was was funded by Petronas to build fuel cells in 2006, and he built a electrolyzer in 2014, 15. Professor Dato. And in India, this is in fact the third wave of uh, hydrogen development in terms of policy. Right? They've been pushing for this since the early, you know, since the 90s. But I think Southeast Asia um, and India, for that matter, you know, we had so many other challenges uh, that we faced to come where we are today. But uh, I don't know the situation in Africa or anywhere else in the globe to make a comparison. But all I can say is, you know, we've done our bit, but maybe maybe behind. But I can be sure that we catch up. Okay, I think Peter, you have a question for? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually linked to something I've referenced in our presentation actually earlier. And, and, and Nishant, you, you sort of said some really interesting um, ideas like uh, electrolyzer leasing and talked about contracts for difference as well for longer term um, agreements. And it's more that latter. Um, have you seen any? any interest or potential hypotheticals on other types of innovative mechanisms? So I was talking before about things like advanced market commitments or you know, patent buyouts, pay for success bonds, these types of approaches that the governments can help to facilitate anything. Is that something that for green hydrogen might be a solution? Well, um, I have been in so many discussions, nobody's you know, asked me something like this back and I did take note of your presentation. And um, I think, um, all possibilities exist, right? And now to begin with, for example, even with our uh, electrolyzer leasing model, there was um, this conversation actually happened in London. My partner who runs the whole finance, uh, he sits out of London and um, there was an insurance provider who was ready to you know, guarantee uh, efficiency loss and also revenue loss, right? Just for a few basis points on, you know, on top of the price. So in addition to that, I think the other model that we're looking at is, um, the one that German ha Germany has H2R, you know, the, I think it's called the European Hydrogen Bank. I'm not sure if there's one, uh, but Germany also has one with nationally. And in India, um, I don't know if many of you all know, India has the lowest solar prices. And when we had to kick off this industry, India had an aggregator model called SECI. And now if we can do the same thing for hydrogen, where we have an aggregator, right? And this, uh, this could be a national level aggregator, sector-based state-based and we sign long-term agreements and you know and you know fcdo or you know adb and even the governments can come in you know 
finance those CFDs or it could be a listed instrument that, you know, if we can prove it, uh, there was an insurance fund as well that was interested in this, right? If, you know, once once it's, all, it's up and it's kicked off, they are ready to buy into this, right? So a long-term fund like that also can help finance this. Um, but, you know, I'll be happy to take this conversation uh, offline and you know, introduce you to Sanmit, who will be better equipped to answer this. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, the lady had a question. I guess it was about certification. Yeah, thank Correct. you. Yeah, I'm interested in hydrogen certification. I noticed uh, more and more countries starting to implement hydrogen certificate, some planning like UK, European Union, Korea, Japan, right? So then for exporting hydrogen countries, right, do we have to take every certificate? That's costly, right? I think it would be better if countries said, yes, we have our national certificate, but we also accept UK, European Union, and other countries, if you have. So then exporter will take only one certificate, and that's it, rather than taking each country certificate. Thank you. I think, uh, who wants to take it? But yeah. I think Dr. Ajman also. Yeah, certificate. Certificate. Well, that's, that's also another. Um, so we have these five stars and 29 action plans in the, so we're talking about also certification. As, as the walls are evolving towards it. But um, yeah, there's, there's this challenge in the law. I can't remember the TCISO referrals. Um, what was that in for hydrogen? So the challenge is that in Malaysia, that it's not amongst industry players um, uh, and anything that, that they are looking at. So it's already, it's in the, in the in something that we're looking at. Uh, can't recall the, the, the ISO, the TC standards the certification, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite lacking, quite lagging in terms of, uh, I mean, adopting it uh, in among industry players that we are going to be um, focusing on. I mean, one of the things that we are have listed in, in the strategies. Okay, and then maybe it's just to add on. I mean, st standardization is really a key issue when it comes to certification because you indeed see that many different countries are adopting different standards, both in terms of what their carbon thresholds are. Is it 3.4 kilograms? Is it four kilograms like in Korea? Uh, but also in terms of like what the additional requirements are. Do you have additionality, meaning you can't take renewables away from the grid that are already on the grid? Do you have temporal matching? Do you, can you only generate hydrogen when you're actually producing renewables or do you look at it on, an, on a yearly basis? Um, I think the problem right now is indeed for a potential exporter is that they don't know which standards to adhere to. Of course, the obvious class answer to that right now is okay fix your off taker first determine who your off taker will be because you're only going to be bound by their national requirements um, of course in general that's a risk also because these thresholds might change over time so definitely like harmonization across different countries would really benefit in kind of de-risking this from from a supplier perspective um, of course this is going to take quite a while and i think it's We'll just kind of have to see, first of all, like what is the impact going to be of certain certificates on the hydrogen price? So, for example, if it's too strict, will that really mean that the hydrogen price is too high and no one wants to buy it? So that balance will really have to be found. But I think like if the first projects come online and we get some experience with the impact of the different certification schemes, that will rapidly be moving towards a more, more standardization and more security for the, uh, for the producers. Well, Dina, let me answer this uh, in in two separate um, areas. Number one, this is an evolving space, and you know even big countries are still not clear about what standards they want to set for green hydrogen. And uh, every month, every week, you know the debates are still going on. And there are things, honestly, there's no like, for example, uh, carbon em fugitive emissions in the production, store emissions in storage and transportation. There are no international standards that are set forth, right? And people are still working on it. The ISO is only coming out with its definition of green hydrogen in September. So it's an evolving space, but as the green hydrogen organization, we knew that this is a critical component for the acceleration of this adoption. So we've been working on this for the last one and a half years. So if you can look up the green hydrogen standard, it's, um, it's, it's a dedicated website. So last year we presented our findings in COP26, and since then, you know, a lot of regulations have changed across the world. So we are working with an international group. Um, anyone here is welcome if you're an expert in the field, right? So we have six working groups that is looking at e-methane, uh, data standards, emissions in um, transport and storage, in fugitive emissions. 
So if you're interested in developing the standard with us, you know, you're welcome to join us. And what we are aiming to do and address this whole um, issue about different standards across the world is we have a modular approach, wherein, you know, when we look at your um, RE, RE power, or when you look at your production, you know, we have different modular uh, uh, components where based on, you know, if there are requirements in the EU for hourly matching or daily matching, right, we can fit that in. And if Japan is not gonna have that, you know, we can remove that off. So we are looking at a certification and standard mechanism that can address these challenges, but there's nobody. Yes, you have a question? Uh, my name is Ed Travis. I'm a PhD student over at uh, University of the Philippines studying H2 production. Uh, an important part of my research involves uh, the, ge the geospatial siting of H2 production. And uh, been a number of great presentations today addressing that issue. But over two sessions, I think we missed one important aspect of H2 production, and that is uh, for example, if you do a Google search on the topic of uh, the water crisis, you find that uh, there's a lot of concern about the supply of water for things like agriculture, the human needs, much less electrolysis. So my question is uh, specifically for Serene uh, in Singapore. I know they have a very well-managed supply of water using various supplies. And also for mats on a more general sense, uh, is this is this something I should be concerned about? I know there's research under being taken on in China and other places about using salt water as a supply. Uh, it's not very far advanced yet, but uh, is this something that I should be concerned about in my research, or is this a real problem? Thank you. So just to I take out of a second my role as moderator, but uh, Irina is studying this topic in particular as we speak. Uh, it's uh, not a problem uh, of water in, in total because we consume way more water for agriculture and power yes. generation and coal uh, and so on and so forth. The issue of water is mostly local for the hydrogen production plant that may that some hydrogen gigafactories are placed in places that will have water stress in the future and yeah. will compete for water. That, that's that's actually, uh, that's actually an issue and we are going to publish a report about it uh, uh, in a few months. But now Great. back yeah, to the I'll panelists. Yeah, uh, if I could be funny. Yeah, 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 if anyone has any. In Malaysia, uh, for example, I know that places like East Malaysia and Peninsular Malaysia, you know, the Peninsular Malaysia, Saro in uh, Parak, they've got great sources of water in the, in the closed mines, the tin mines. But it's a general question, not specific to any one country. Ed, we've run out of time, mate. Yeah. I'm sorry, we've run I'm out of sorry, time. I'm sorry, I said zero. Yeah, just went offline and chat about it, Mark. Okay. Okay, thanks, mate. I have to ask you to finish up. Yeah, so this is, I see a, a blinking zero in front of me. I think the bomb is exploded. Oh, but, but, uh, boom. Uh, but oh, we I had an earthquake already could, today. Uh, I think uh, uh, it was productive. Uh, I think uh, what we learned today is that uh, hydrogen in Southeast Asia is possible. Hydrogen in Southeast Asia, there is a market. There is someone who wants to buy it. There is someone who can produce it. Uh, but uh, not, it will not happen without collaboration. And maybe ADB can provide that platform for this kind of collaboration in the region. Thank you, Daniele. Uh, I'm sorry, Emanuele. My, apologies. My colleague was Daniele. Um, just to finish off, Firstly, thank you to all the panelists and thank you everyone who's come in. A couple of very interesting points out of that, um, that over these two sessions, there's a case of that there are low hanging fruit that we should do and there are things that we should not be engaged in. There are people working in this space. It's very interesting because GH2, Unido, uh, Arena and even World Bank, who you very kindly introduced us to, um, who we hadn't been working with, uh, we can actually work with them and get to get together. Very interesting point. We have a product called financial intermediation where we give banks, insurance companies and financial institutions a sum of money, typically 25% of the loan. So what that would mean is that if you came to ADB and with a large UK based insurance company with a good balance sheet and said you wanted $100 million, I guarantee that they would be very interested to talk to you. The question's going to be, and this is the one thing we haven't said this thus far, and Ed sort of touched on it, is how do we ensure that this is a just energy transition? 
And that's another panel for another day, but it's a very important question we have to ask. How do we make this locally relevant for people in the areas it's working in? And how do we protect those people who maybe get disenfranchised by it? So, grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you. You're Danish or? I don't care. Okay. All right. So on that, um, thank you very much. We're going to do a group photo and then thank you everybody. We'll see you tomorrow for the height of the ocean session that I'm running as well. So thank you very much. Well done.